morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for waking up this early to attend our event today. This very event, Roundtable on Palm Oil Plantation Sector, is jointly organized by the CO Action Network and Climate Governance Malaysia, which is the Malaysian chapter of the World Economic Forum's Climate Governance Initiative. This event is also supported by two organizations, which are the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, also known as the RSPO, as well as Sun Dabi Plantation. We are really honored to have invited nine expert panelists to join us in our discussion today. They all come from highly esteemed backgrounds where you can find their respective resume profiles attached in the folder that have been shared with you earlier. Alternatively, feel free to just scan the QR code attached on the screen here for more reference. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Sri Sunita Raja Kumar, the Chairman of Climate Governance Malaysia, as well as the Steering Committee and World Stream Lead of CO Action Network, to give a welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to Dr. Sri Sunita, please. Thank you, Shin. Thank you, everyone, for coming out here uh, relatively early on a Monday morning. CO Action Network and Climate Governance Malaysia have been running the roundtable sessions. This is the third year now, and it's really to try and raise sustainability and climate ambition. This is a mobilization of the private sector because there's only so much that we can do within business. But if government can meet us halfway or more than halfway, so much more can be done. We've been running roundtable sessions across multiple sectors, and you're all welcome to please keep track of and follow or read up about these other roundtable sessions. The report of proceedings every year is pulled together by PwC and it is then presented to key ministries and to regulators like Bangkara Securities Commission and Bursa Malaysia. The plantation sector has a huge responsibility. We have some of the largest landowners in the country in this room, represented in this room, we want to halt deforestation, and this means there's limited amounts of arable land remaining. Businesses are profiteering from this land with commodity crops in a country with no food security and a freshwater crisis because we have 99% contaminated rivers, leaving land leached with chemicals. And therefore, this sector has a massive role to play, to be responsible growers in all senses. Can we challenge ourselves to stay ahead of the sustainability and climate narrative, manage our climate, climate risks, increase our climate resilience versus reacting and responding to external pressures from trading partners, for example? Can the plantation sector step up and help to decarbonize the grid, decarbonize our economy, preserve our biodiversity and nature, so we're looking for thought leaders who are going to be driving this conversation and leading the way, which will naturally create distance between them and their competitors. And we have curated such a panel of speakers today. I'm looking forward to hearing from them. And we'll thank you once again for supporting this. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot for the welcoming remarks, Dr. Sri Sunita. Okay, now it's time for our first panel discussion to officially commence. We will run two panel sessions before we have a short break and recommence with the third panel and final session of the day. So should you have any questions that you would like to ask the panelists, please step forward to the mic, to the two mics placed over here. And please be careful of the mic cables over there. Thank you. First, let's welcome Mr. Joseph De Cruz, CEO of the RSPO, to the moderate to be the moderator of all our panel discussions today. Welcome, Mr. JD. Hello. Our first panel discussion will focus on deforestation, where we'll dive into the topic of monitoring zero deforestation commitments, as well as ensuring traceability during the process. We have three panelists for this round, and they are Mr. Asmi Yaakob, Group Chief Strategic Communications Officer for FGV Holdings Perhat, Mr. Oliver Tishin, Director of Sustainability of Musimas, 
as well as Mr. Yan Hun Song, Head of Impact and Senior Data Scientist at RSP Home. Dear panelists, please step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shen. And um, good morning, everyone. Uh, the first slightly offensive part of the day was that none of my panelists apparently was to sit next to me, hence the slight delay before we began. But I have all of them here, and I'm looking forward to having a very interesting discussion with them in the morning. To set the scene, first of all, we envision this being very much an intimate conversation. So as you see, we have not invited a large number of people. We've set up the rooms so that we are quite close to each other. And we hope that this will allow us to structure a conversation that helps all of us understand where we need to go in this industry in order to, be, to demonstrate and to ensure the sustainability of our work in the years to come. And we particularly want to structure this conversation around a set of specific actions, specific ideas, that we can take to the industry, and particularly to government, on how we can strengthen the ability of the industry to power sustainability in Malaysia in the coming decades. Our first panel is on the topic of deforestation. But let me give you a bit of a, um, a cheat. The main question we're asking ourselves is not how do we ensure there's no deforestation in the palm sector in Malaysia, because that's a question that's largely been solved. And HS Hansum, I think, will cover briefly some of the data around that. The challenge we face, we believe, is how do we clearly demonstrate that the palm oil that's produced in Malaysia is deforestation free? What's the most effective way of doing that? And how do we do that in a way that ensures that all the different players in the industry, upstream and downstream, including particularly small holders and small growers, can be part of that process? And hopefully in the course of that conversation, we'll also take on some ideas about how that conversation around demonstrating compliance with certification standards can evolve in the years to come with support from government and other actors. So on that note, I'm going to pass over, first of all, to our colleague HS Yen. Um, we'll run through a bit of the, the overview of where we stand on deforestation and some of the data that will help contextualize where we go. HS, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I think there was a pre-read that was sent out. Um, it consists of five slides, and it really is a pull-out of several um, research studies that are out there <clears throat> that talk about trends in deforestation. And is it up there? Oh, it's up. Um, the first one uh, is an extract from the WRI, World Resources Institute, that shows the deforestation trends in seven agro commodities. Um, over the 20-year period from 2001 to 2019. And what it shows is that, with the exception of cattle, um, there has been a noticeable declining trend in deforestation associated with crops such as rubber, palm oil, soy, uh, and cocoa as well, um, since 2010. So there was a rise in deforestation in the early first decade of the 21st century. From 2010 onwards, there was a noticeable decline. Um, the data sets are incomplete, but they have given us permission to share their latest stats. And what we see in palm oil, soy, and cocoa is that the decline continues after 2015. The second slide shows you a abstract from the Hayes Outlook from the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. And that really is to show that since 2010, there has been a noticeable decoupling of deforestation associated with commodity prices. And the three commodities being referenced there are palm oil, rubber, and cocoa. So there was strong correlation between deforestation and commodity prices from 20, 2000 to 2010. But since 2010, there has been a noticeable decoupling. And although that is not a conclusive uh, correlation, that, had, that correlation has been attributed to the intervention of governments, uh, awareness of sustainability, um, and also national policy. And finally, the last few slides will show you our RSPO data derived from our uh, WR as well, from Malaysia and Indonesia that shows a significant decline in deforestation associated with oil palm. Um, I think in Indonesia, it's a 95% reduction from the period 2006 to 2010, 
uh, to the current period 2019 2020. Uh, deriving from that, we see that deforestation levels have decreased. They're not exactly absent, but there are pockets of risk that still remain. And the, I think the final slide shows some uh, chain reaction researches, the chain uh, research that shows that there are still pockets, but they know that as well. And as RSPO, we've been pushing the the discussion, the ceiling on what deforestation, on halting deforestation since our foundation in 2004, and where we can uh, make an impact, we have, but we also recognize that we don't cover the entire industry. And this is where national standards such as MSPO and ISPO come in, because they can cover the, part, the bits of species of the industry that the RSPO doesn't cover, while the RSPO focuses on driving the discussion forward. So a lot of this is essentially just to say, data to say that deforestation is not as large a risk as it was in the past. It's manageable. It's, uh, it's, they, we have the data to actually uh, track it. Uh, but also one thing, that it's also a consequence of national policy. In Malaysia, that are largely manageable. But in 2022, deforestation in the Amazon reached its all-time peak. And that resulted in very, very apocalyptic forest fires. And that boils down to national policy. Haya Bosirado was elected president in 2019, and he pursued a, a policy of extraction in the Amazon. And that led to a lot of deforestation, all time peaks 2022. And in response, you had climate crisis. Uh, forest fires are unheard of. Amazon, there is a humid tropical environment. For forest fires that actually happen in that region, in that biome, it is actually uh, not naturally occurring. Lula, um, who's now the president of uh, Brazil, was elected on an explicit campaign to reverse the deforestation policies put in by Jair Bolsonaro. So while deforestation has declined to a level where it's largely manageable in certain crops, national policies can actually make a difference in how that's being implemented. But that being said, I think the current situation that we have, at least in Malaysia and Indonesia, is that deforestation are at controllable levels, 90% reduction from what it was, and declining. And so it's not necessarily a, an issue of the data. We have the data. We have the satellites that monitor this. We have the maps that we can pull tell us who's doing well, who's not doing well. The question is, how do we transmit that information? And that's a question of communication, backed by technology. It's traceability, because while we in this room perhaps know that exactly what we've done as an industry in terms of good, in terms of pushing deforestation levels down to area, in areas uh, and ranges that are largely risk-free, um, how do we transmit that information to how do we ensure that the first importer into Europe, or the first exporter out of Europe, which is defined by the EU PR legislation on deforestation, has access to the information on deforestation and associated topics, that they can make an informed decision on supplying their customers with products that are deforestation free. It's not a question of what we've achieved. It's how do we narrate and how do we transmit that information so that the people down the supply chain can make the informed decisions that they should make. And I will hand this over back to JD. Thanks very much, Ajit. Um, so in summary, we have data that shows that while there was deforestation associated with commodities that were found, that correlation, that connection, has declined significantly for well over a decade. We, we know that the impact of government policy in this area is significant, and it just pointed to both the role of the national certification scheme, the MSPO, as well as overall government policy as a way to ensure that deforestation is tackled. So in short, we know how to solve the problem, and largely in this region, and in Malaysia, the topic of our conversation today, um, we have solved the problem. We now need to be able to demonstrate that to traceability a combination of data and being able to communicate that data. The 
But there is a layer to this also, um, which needs to be talked about, which is ensuring that as we create the systems to demonstrate traceability, as we create the policies and regulations to show that the commodities that we produce and consume are deforestation free and are sustainable in other ways, we don't build systems that exclude people at the margins. Particularly of concern to us in the industry is that we don't build systems and structures and regulatory requirements that risk excluding smallholders, independent producers, in more remote areas and more marginal areas. And it's on that topic to start off with that I'd like to pass over to Olivia, because Musimas, which Olivia works with, um, has done a lot of work over the years to ensure the inclusion of smallholders in the, the various regions they work with. Um, in Indonesia. Um, we had, of course, decided to invite one token Indonesian representative to the conversation, and that's Olivia today. So, over to you, Olivia. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thank you for having me here. It's always good to be neighborly. I think this is a good way of being neighborly. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a very important topic in common, and that's obviously part one. Um, I think we, I will not repeat what Asia has said on the fact that deforestation now is not the central issue in terms of implementing no deforestation. That's something we can indeed consider has been achieved by Indonesia Malaysia. Um, on the other hand, there are still a few issues, uh, and that, that's what I'm going to talk about, in particular with small birds. So I'm going to focus on Indonesia. I, I just know my, uh, my strong point, but that's where we have direct influence on small birds, work on small birds. I think it still is of high relevance to Malaysia, if only because there are so many Malaysian companies operating in Indonesia. So we are in the, definitely in the same boat there. I think we all love smallholders, and there's many of them to love. There's about three million of them in Indonesia. Smallholders are great, everybody likes a small farmer, but they pose quite a lot of specific issues. And uh, for example, they are independent. So they are in our supply chain today, not in our supply chain tomorrow. They are planting palm today, they were planting rubber yesterday, they might plant something else tomorrow. How do we know that? They are independent actors. We cannot tell them what to do. And this is good for them, but this is obviously posing quite a lot of issues. They're also, by essence, quite small, and they tend to be not organized by themselves. So they are using networks, <coughs> trade networks, which rely on middlemen. There might be more than one. So there is an element of difficulty there on how do we link to them. For them, it's a great opportunity. They are free. They can sell. They can, they, are, they can get the best price. They have a lot of opportunity. So how do we make that work at the end of the day? Because it poses a problem. How do we trace back? I think the big discussion is about traceability. I would say traceability is indeed a problem because it's seen most of the time as a linear process. Farmer, middleman, mill, refinery. Linear, unstable process. It's not. So how do we live with that reality and how do we still use and how do we manage this? Also, and I, I will answer that question to a point, is that is it not a distraction to try to get to that perfect picture, that perfect traceability, and that perfect transparency of the way we perceive it in that linear traceability? Is that not a distraction to what we want to achieve, which is how do we demonstrate how do we pass on that information, like I just said, of the fact that there is no deforestation in the supply base? And how do we pass that on? How do we demonstrate it and pass it on? Because a lot of the smallholders, without knowing it, are already deforestation free. They do not know it. We kind of know it because we look at them as a base. We do not have that direct link to each and every one of them. But what really counts? What counts is to show that there is no deforestation in our supply chain. So there is, there is maybe some sort of opportunity because we know that it's the way forward is to include smaller. It's not only the right thing to do because we can say, oh, the poor little smaller. I'll be honest, I think anybody in the room who has worked with smaller knows that they are not happy. We have to look at them as very rational and sometimes ruthless agents. So we have to give them that respect and we have to look at them also as normal economic actors. But there's a massive opportunity, not only to do the right thing, but I think for our industry, and definitely Indonesia, it's a critical part for the future of our industry. Either we get small birds to be better performers, to be better farmers, or we will have an issue in our, in our industry. 
how are we going to sustain growth? How are we going to sustain the demand for palm oil if we do not get smallholders to vastly increase their yields and be better integrated in the supply chain? We must do it, if only for our selfish interest. So I'm saying that, I've been, I, it's no it's a big secret, we do it, it's the right thing, and it's the right thing, in any possible manner. So how do we address that? There is the element of certification. The certification has the same flows as verification. It's a massive investment for something which is static. And in this case, if we talk specifically about deforestation, we are basically, I don't know if you have the same expression in uh, in, in uh, Malay for matter in Indipasta, you would say Jaga Balan Yadi. So basically how do so basically we are trying to demonstrate something which is already there. So we really need to invest large resources to do that. Should we not find other ways of doing it? So instead of certification, is there not a value there to verification? And I know it runs a bit against the grain. It's very nice to have a certificate. You can hang it on the wall, you can count how many people have been certified, you have a nice standard, and it's very nice. And it is useful. And standards and certification are useful. But is it the only answer to every issue that we have in our industry? I do not think so. Standards can be, you mentioned the, obviously we can mention the RSPO. The RSPO has a role there, as maybe for innovation, I would say, as well. But is it really the standard for no deforestation? Should it spend all its energy on demonstrating no deforestation? We should not. But I'll share briefly, because I'm sure I'm running out of time, about what seems to be working in Indonesia at the moment, which is new, and which we find very interesting. So how do we blend, how do we manage to make the industry, civil society, and government work together? As has been said before, the governments have played a central role in ensuring there is no deforestation. The industry, the private sector, also by saying we will not accept deforestation in our supply chains and how can we monitor it? And we're quite efficient at it and we exclude people who are deforesting wantonly. The civil society has also been highly involved into this by pointing out, oh, you say that that producer is not deforesting when we can show you they are. All right, and we investigate. Sometimes they are right, sometimes they are not. But there is a dialogue. How do we make all that happen together? We are very fortunate in Indonesia at the moment that there is, there are a couple of districts. For you, for those of you familiar in Indonesia, you've got the national level, the provincial level, so you are your states. And you have a lower than that, the district level, the Kabupaten. The Kabupaten are critical. They are smaller administrative levels. There's about 400 of them, plus about 100 cities, some of which are as big as some of the Kabupaten. And they are the ones delivering the service. They are, so I, use, I know I should not use that expression, but they are on the gold face. Bad expression in sustainability, but technically they are on it. Effectively they are. They are the ones facing the farmers, they are the ones facing armies, they are the ones facing the local civil society. They are the ones delivering the service. They are also the ones doing the enforcement. So how, what is happening currently is that we see in a few areas in Indonesia, in a few of those districts, the local government creating what they call forums for farms, not in particular, but also they do it for landscape level management. And that is quite interesting. You have local government, civil society, private sector, working together on seeing how do we make things work, how do we manage the landscape, how do we plan, how we will manage our landscape using sometimes tools like HDD, HD assessment, high carbon value, high conservation value, high carbon stock assessments at the landscape level, integrating it, incorporating it in their management plans, and having a, a space in which there is some sort of co-management. Why is it valuable in the, in the deforestation scene? because it is also the place where you can have the management of exceptions, so a bridge. What is nice is that it, it can lead to what is, so in one landscape they call it verified sourcing, uh, sourcing, um, ah, now I forgot what the A is for. A pro no, it's not approach, it's a verified sourcing area. Thank you, how can I forget such a small word? And uh, verified sourcing area. And where basically you say that the entire area is compliant with no deforestation. So you sidestep the certification space, you sidestep the involvement of the private sector to a point, or you do not put it on every company's desk, but you have it at the landscape level managed together, and so you take, you take that central issue and you get it to co 
all managed. It's not in every district in Indonesia, but we see it gaining ground. And that seems to be quite a good solution because you have, like I said, the three parties there, civil society, local government, private sector, and you address an issue which is not only central to farm, but also to rubber, to cocoa, and basically you build the future. And you do not do it with certification, you do it with co-management. I think um, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. Um, again, an interesting direction of travel for us to reflect on as we pull back the focus a little bit to where we are in Malaysia, which is what I'll ask, um, ask you to pick up on in a minute. Um, in Indonesia, the ability of the government at the local level to be able to verify deforestation free across the landscape mm -hmm. effectively reduces the burden on companies or very possibly individual smallholders to have to prove this through a very onerous supply chain traceability mechanism. Um, we are probably not there yet in Malaysia, but we do have in Malaysia the advantage that our industry is heavily built around a number of a small number of large players like MGB, um, working quite closely with government from the government thing. So she asked me maybe a bit of a reflection from your side of FGD on what's happening in the industry here, what FGD is doing, and we can start steering that towards where we'd like to see perhaps stronger direction from the government on these issues here. Uh, thanks, JD. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think, first of all, thanks to the organizers and the sponsors for inviting FGD to be one of the uh, panels this morning. I think it's crucial for FGD to be here this morning, especially when you talk about the topic of deforestation and traceability. I think not many people know that uh, FGB is actually one of the world's largest producers of palm oils. We have slightly different motivation model than Sangdali because two thirds of our fresh fruit bunches, so I have a B, actually sourced from the smallholders. I think uh, Olivia has actually provided a very good information, knowledge about who smallholders are and how do they work. And I think uh, he has also provided a very good overview in terms of where we are in terms of deforestation. And that these are crucial in the fact that these two elements of deforestation and traceability are the critical focus areas that also actually very much explain in our sensitivity framework that FGD will be mentioned very, very soon. So I think it's critical for us to be here in terms of speaking from the voice of the smallholders because of the fact that we need to actually make sure that the smallholders are with us now and in the future to ensure the sensitivity of the business, not just for FGD making profits, but ensuring the livelihood of these smallholders, especially coming from Felga settlers, independent smallholders. So we need to make sure that whatever that we do for these smallholders are actually fulfilling the objective of the government in terms of improving their livelihood, improving their lifestyle, improving their cost standard, and so on, improving their living standards as well, eventually ensuring the sustainability of the business as well. I think I wanted to actually share with you guys um, Recently, FGB, when we talk about smallholders and how important these smallholders are to our business operations, we have actually been doing quite a number of engagements, uh, on the ground engagement with the smallholders. Uh, previous years, and I think recently, late last year and this year, we'll be embarking on nine different smallholders engagement sessions nationwide where our operations are actually established. We have actually completed five of them. In fact, today we'll be having, there's actually another session going on in Guatna. This session is actually a session that we actually organize in conjunction with um, the authorities, with the certification bodies, in terms of really educating these smallholders about the importance of the certifications and what are the roles and responsibilities in terms of contributing to the success of MGV as one of the producers with them coming on board, producing the fresh food batches of FMEs. Uh, I just wanted to share a few pertinent points that we actually get from, from these engagement sessions. I personally took time to actually attend one of those sessions, so I actually get a good grasp in terms of uh, what are the concerns, what are the challenges of the smallholders. We've got to bear in mind, yeah, when we talk about smallholders, they are not like this. They are these people, folks from the Kampong, from rural areas. Yeah? They could be illiterate. Some of them can't read. Some of them don't have the same privileges as we are in this hall. So there's a lot of constraints when we talk about dealing with the smallholders, language and so on, yeah? And they are the ones who always marginalize when we talk about having a middleman buying goods from them. So we need to ensure these factors are always taken into consideration to ensure sensibility of business in the future by the smallholders. Um, one, of, one of the most important concerns that we have from the sessions is the fact that we talk about RSPO, we talk about MSPO. As much as possible, these smallholders will be planting all for the last, you know, 
uh, very long time, yeah, decades ago, yeah, we've been producing for more for the longest time possible. We were talking about certification. I think it's not that we want to comply. We, as the subject matter experts, I think there are quite a number of comms experts in this hall as well, uh, who are actually in the same shoes as mine. Um, it's just a mention about narrative. It's not about what we have actually done, but more on in terms of communicating what we narrative in the future, in terms of getting commitments from these people to be the advocates of the, of the companies in terms of championing sustainability, we're talking about deforestation and also traceability. Uh, one concern that we have is they need to understand more in terms of why do they need to actually do this? Why certification matters? And then how this will actually impact our view in the future? Yeah? I think they're more concerned in terms of making money, yes. I think they, they need to whether they're living out of the out of groups and, and so on. But we need to ensure that we are doing this. The government is actually concentrating their efforts, the authorities, yeah, the civil organizations, NGOs, even FGVs and some some like IOI, and so on, we mentioned that. Uh, who actually within the industry are doing this to ensure that whatever that you do now will be sustainable in the future. So there's a lot of narrative that needs to be done, messaging that needs to be done in terms of educating these small holders, these machi machi from Kapo that have zero knowledge about sustainability, zero knowledge about certifications, educating them about what these certifications are and what are the rationale of us going for certifications and going for deforestation and going for traceability efforts. Going forward as well. Once we have good knowledge, understanding among these stakeholders, this is where we go into change management journey. Yeah, we educate them first, make them understand that what's going on, what are the roles we'll be playing. Then later, eventually, hopefully, few years down the road, they'll be the advocates of sustainability among the stakeholders community. So that's what we envision in terms of uh, having stakeholders as a very core player of the industry to be advocates of sustainability in the future. The other one, the second concern or the second challenge that we always gather from this group of people, they talk about financial affordability. I think when you talk about certifications, it does not come for free. There's a lot of social capital investments, uh, money that you've got to put into, especially initial costs of being certified, whether it's RSPO or MSPO. So I think these small holders who are very much earn enough to earn their living on a monthly basis, we need to help them. Government have to help them. Different parties need to help them in terms of having a decent amount of capital for them to actually be certified and guide them through the process so they will be able to, to be certified eventually uh, in one day. Right? I think the third thing that we captured from the engagement, uh, they also talk about the land title. They face challenges to obtain their land titles in the family man. It is where we talk about the bureaucracies, the records you've got to go within the government agencies in terms of making sure that they have got secure land titles. And this is very crucial because you've got traceability, because you need to trace where is the is coming from. Who is the supplier, where is the land, who has the volume, and so on. And I think last but not least, um, another concern that they mentioned is, of course, we talk about financial right. We need to be assisted in terms of financial affordability. They will say that with the likes of MGB so, uh, We've been paying them the standard rate for the last few years. Despite of the fact that we have been certified. Some of them actually are exposed certified. So what they're actually looking forward is the fact that with the amount of investment I actually put into my certifications, can you also give me a premium price in return of my investments, which I think is a, is a very human altogether. And I think this does not just apply to LGB but other industry players, in terms of, okay, these are the costs they have to put in. You are certified, you are moving towards the bandwagon in terms of sustainability. These are your rewards for going through the process. And this is the way we actually get the buy-in commitments from these holders in terms of making sure that they actually we are talking the same voice. And I think, uh, Olivier, you mentioned about stakeholders engagement. Yeah, I think this is one of the core areas we talk about advocacy and lobbying. So whatever that we do here in Malaysia, especially in terms of deforestation, traceability. I think it needs to be a more considered effort by the relevant stakeholders, whether they are ministries, agencies, industry players, NGOs, uh, associations, yeah. We need to be speaking the same voice. I think the setup is pretty much there, but it needs to be more amplified. It needs to be stronger in terms of the voice, shouting the same voice from Malaysia so that the world actually hears. So that's just my, my point to be right Thank you very much, Jasmine, for sort of bringing that back home, particularly in the context of what 
the important role of government not only in dealing with the certification of the verification of sustainable production, but also helping particularly smallholders deal with some of the underlying challenges they face in order to have the kind of systems in place that the market demands on land title, on access to finance, etc. I'm going to open up the conversation now to all of you as well, um, your thoughts and reflections on this. With bearing in mind, what we're really trying to focus on here is to frame the question and start talking about what we collectively and particularly government can do to help address these issues. So to recap quickly, deforestation itself is not really a major large-scale problem. There are some small kids, small scale patches of these, and often in fact the data shows these are associated with smallholders earning livelihoods. The challenge we face is to be able to demonstrate that we're producing oil palm in a deforestation free way. Remembering importantly that part of that demonstration includes very specific things like being able to trace the ownership of a plot of land, land titles that Jen talked about, which tend to be a very major constraint, particularly for smallholders. Olivia pointed to the interesting evolution in places like Indonesia, where there is a gradual shift away from depending only on certification, which is basically to be able to document and demonstrate all the way through the supply chain that a product you're producing comes from places before a But to move away from certification, to move to verification, where you can say, we have a system, a policy, a government structure, or others in this entire region to demonstrate that everything that comes from this region is deforestation free. Which means individual producers, smallholders, and companies within those areas do not have to each individually certify and prove their deforestation free status. That verification approach requires national policy. It just talked about the fact that national policy has been so critical to driving deforestation free production in many parts of the world. How do we then build on that to have? National policy also help us demonstrate and verify that our production is deforestation free as a way to deal with some of the challenges that Jasmine is talking about from the smallholder side. Then, last but not least, on the government side, linked to this is if we want to ensure that our smallholder production in particular is deforestation free, how do we ensure that smallholders have access to the solutions they need to be able to produce sustainably, including access to finance, including access to technical capacity and resources, access to markets? access to land title. So that's the frame. I invite now all of you to add any particular perspectives, questions you may have, um, additional thoughts you want to add to that conversation about what we need to do and, and the role we see government playing. The floor is open, um, the mics are available. Please quickly introduce yourself when you come up so we know who we're talking to and look forward to seeing what you have to say as well. Always hard to get. start with those two. Um, on the question of the differences in definition of deforestation, um, I'm going to ask HS quickly to touch on this, noting that if you work in this industry, opening up the question of what is a forest or what is not is a can of worms that people have been arguing about for years. I will note though, one of the interesting things you talk about the EU deforestation regulation is that 
It requires that products be deforestation free as of 31st December 2020. Whereas oddly, when you look at the national regulations in Malaysia or the standards of RSPO, our standards actually require deforestation free status from long before that. So there are different thresholds. But it's just very quickly maybe on answering the question, what are the differences? Yeah, I think um, um, in doing so, we'll probably answer the second question as well. There is actually no standard way of defining deforestation, but the reference that most people use is the technical definition, which I will quote from the EUDR text. Um, land, forest means land spanning more than 0 0.5 hectares with trees higher than 5 meters and a canopy cover of 10%. The 10% is important because that's what's happening. Deforestation, as defined by the EDR, is clearing of that land, excluding land that is for plantation use. So replanting is not included, and urban use. So that is the definition that the FAO, it's a combination of the FAO definition and also realities in certain commodities where clearing does happen for replanting. Uh, that is the standard that uh, the EU has chosen go into, uh, but I also do note that in the EUDR, they have signaled in Annex Article 32 that uh, in one or two years they will be looking at broadening the definition of forests to environmental degradation to include specifically underwater land, peatlands, uh, woodlands, wetlands, and areas of high biodiversity. And in, that, in this arena, I would have to say the palm oil industry is actually on the ball, because through the RSPO and now in SPO and uh, ISPO, those definitions are covered. Um, the environmental scope that the sustainability uh, lens on the palm oil industry is broad enough to actually meet the current UDR requirements and also what is signaling within the text. Thanks, Jess. So, yes, in short, the definitions do differ. But the good news is if you look at the standards that the industry here in Malaysia has subscribed to, like RSPO and MSPO, we are basically already using definitions that are as high or better. It's just a question of being able to prove it in the format that our overseas markets often require. Now, check this out, a question about the perception gap, the fact that we know we're doing a good job, but that perception of problems still exists overseas. Um, I'm happily going to toss it over to ask me for a quick reflection, knowing that this is not something that in less than a year the job will manage to solve yet. All right, thanks, Jerry. And thanks, Jerry, for asking the question. I think it's good to have a pool of comps practitioners in the hall as well, because I think when we talk about sustainability, of course we've got the technical experts, yeah, that actually handles the ownership of sustainability programs within the company. But I think without the comps practitioners, I think we're actually trying to be pulled down, because I think this is very crucial. When you talk about narrative, uh, in terms of how do you communicate, what do you communicate to the stakeholders? Of course, different companies like FGB and Sapphire and some other things who have their different stakeholders. But I think as a whole, to, to reply to your question, we don't. Of course, we have not done enough in terms of uh, correcting the perceptions about sensitivity issues or deforestation. And what we need to do in Malaysia especially, just to actually mirror what is actually being done in Europe or in the US, I think they've got a very strong propaganda, uh, very strong narrative in terms of what they believe in, what they're actually fighting for. I think we need to actually replicate that, customize that for Malaysia scenario, and this is where the cost practitioners from different companies will actually play their roles in terms of communicating the narrative messages on behalf of the organizations. On top of that, I'm actually looking into two product approach. Uh, if we are the players and we are only the one doing the communications, it will not be enough. This is where we need cooperation from MPOC and POB in terms of combining the efforts together and speaking on behalf of the industry as one voice, regardless of the subject matter, what is deforestation and so on. And just to share what happened last week, I think uh, Vita, CEO of uh, MPOC, uh, she was there as well in uh, one of the town halls that we actually did in Belda where different associations of uh, Belta settlers and smallholders organized actually a petition on behalf of the settlers and smallholders protesting against the deforestation by EU. Uh, we, have, we need to have more events like this, more programs like this, where the messages will be amplified further. Yeah? And it does not just like people that have some time. It needs to be continuous, it needs to be regular, and after all, the messaging has to be short and sweet. I think the only debate that I always have in my society is that they want to communicate everything. But you can't afford to be communicating everything. You need to actually pick up all the important languages, important messaging that people need to know at that point of time. That's just my reputation. Okay. If we're right, I'll pass over to Olivia in a moment. Um, I think we have a wonderful caucus of comms people in the room. We can get together with coffee break and <coughs> I would just add to your point, Jasmine. I think 
it's not only a question of being able to counter the narrative of the overseas, but to also be able to craft a strong and credible and authentic narrative of our own about what sustainability means for us in our industry, in our region, in our country, in our society. And to be able to also tell that story. But maybe you should come in as well. Right, and on the same lines, uh, uh, I think, very, can I go ahead and cover something earlier that I think there is very quickly on this? Yes, we need to have a strong narrative of our own indeed, and I think showing, I mentioned smallholders, we do a lot of work on smallholders, I guess it's a very selfish point of view, why we need smallholders for the future of our industry. This is what we need to talk about. You're against Palmer, you're against smallholders. I'm not going to say it's the only thing we can say, but it is true on top of that. The strength of it is that it is true. You want to have no deforestation in the EU in a way that is pretty simplistic, where you will exclude smallholders from the EU. It's a simple fact of life. So I think we need to show the people under the palm. That's, that's an expression I can use. We need to show the people under the palm to explain that palm is not as an abstraction. It's actually people. That leads me to the point that I committed earlier. How did it work in Indonesia for the districts? Why do we see low interest with so mostly natural? Why do we see low interest from the other district, uh, some other district than us? Two points. One, I think they realize that they can deliver a better service and have a more appeased social situation in their district by having these forums. But the second point is that the first forum that was created in uh, Najedania was recognized. That element of recognition, and I'm sorry, as we got, it's not about premium. Interestingly enough, it was not about the money. It was all about the recognition. It was about the fact that the brand, the Western brand, a big Western brand, sent a video from one of their higher ups and said, we recognize what you are doing, and we feel connected to you, even though that, that district was maybe barely in their supply chain. They provided that message. I think we can do the same. We can. We will not find a big brand for every of the 400 districts in Indonesia or the 200 plus districts in the, the farm industry. Or in Malaysia either. But you could do it also with national brands. I think we have to realize, and I, I'll be very honest with that, being a foreign investor, it's not just about the West against the Indonesia and Malaysia in particular. We have to be very wary, like you said, as we, we in the cities, we in this, this hall in particular, we know the farm industry, but if you go in Kuala Lumpur, if you go in Jakarta, let us be very careful that we do not let a gap create itself between the cities and the farmers. I think we have to recognize that. We have to get on that now, before it is a problem. Before our cities become our west, we cannot afford that. So we have an opportunity there to recognize the work of the districts, the work of the farmers of the local governments by linking brands to recognition of the good work done. So I, I keep it alive. But that recognition element is really central. It doesn't cost much, it costs a lot. Lovely. Thank you, Holly. I'm going to keep an eye on the room in case anyone has other thoughts, reflections. Yes, I see one more lady. And I see one more other side. We'll take it tomorrow. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nini. I just have a question. Trying to broaden the deforestation. I know this is a forum to talk about palm, but deforestation could be timber, could be many different things, right? So just wondering, from my knowledge, uh, an organization as RSPO and all, how much do you all speak to the other industry players? And because, like I said, you know, things are think broader, right? Uh, just for my knowledge. For the industry, like there's, there's certification and there's verification. How do we consult the both in the public narrative? Thanks. Well, I see one more. See, now the room is warming up a little bit. This is Benny from IOI. So I agree with the um, saying that to craft authentic uh, narrative of our own. So Malaysia has kept. Uh, uh, what we call commit to have more than fifty percent of our forests be protected. So we have a cap in our oil plantation expansion. So uh, my question is that: so we comply with the MDP as well with RSPO, and MSPO traceability is up to ninety eight percent. So my question is: how 
do we actually uh, talk to the broader, well, uh, what's been mentioned as well, that this fact is there and they have to take it in. And also, um, how, how do we actually ask the government to actually talk to the EU, for example, on the UDR, on leverage to have a benchmark, benchmarking on these facts? Thank you. Thanks, folks. In the interest of time, I'm going to use those three questions a little bit to try and, try and wrap up um, a little bit of what we discussed today. Um, Lily, you asked a question about whether we in the industry, whether we in the RSK are talking to other industry players, and we certainly are. Um, maybe not globally, but in the industries that are relevant to us, like rubber, for instance, and others, the conversation happens. And it's actually, you're right, particularly relevant when you talk about the perspective of Olivia Shadway moving towards verification. Being able to say once and for all, in this region, in this district, certainly in Indonesia, ideally at some point in this entire country, Deforestation is not an issue. Because you can only do that if you're dealing with all the different sources of deforestation. But that again is where I think the, the horizontal conversations among certification standards amongst industries can only take us so far. Without there being a clear framing of this and a clear direction being set by government to say, we need to have all of this become deforestation free. And I know that's a conversation we need to become one further. <laughs> yeah. But that also links into, I think, what Carolyn was saying about. How do we reconcile certification and verification? And again, for those of you in the room who are not adept at this terminology, I certainly wasn't. Um, certification is when you, you basically document for each individual product through a supply chain that is deforestation free. Verification is when you have some way of showing that an entire region or an entire set of production is deforestation free. So if, for instance, you, were, you had a, a national regulation that demonstrated proof that every bit of production Malaysia is verifiably deforestation free, individual smallholders and producers would need to then certify the different production. How do you connect the two? In my own view, speaking personally, I think two things. I think verification becomes an umbrella where once it is strong enough, the certification no longer needs to focus on that. So if I were to translate that into a vision for a certification scheme like RSPO, I can't speak for MSPO, of course, it would be to say, if we got to the point where we had verification that was strong enough that we didn't believe deforestation needed to be a focus of certification, we could effectively reduce the focus on, on deforestation and certification process. Ask fewer questions about that. Demand less documentation on that. And simply point to the verification as being sufficient. There have been, I think, um, uh, standards like FSC and others that have moved in that direction. It's certainly something that's viable for our industry as well. Um, and then, Penny, on, on the point you made about what is, I think, in some respects, the biggest frustration for the industry is if you work on the ground and you know the details and the reality, you know sometimes that the things the market, the industry, our consumers demand we prove by deforestation free aren't even an issue anymore. You know, you're being asked to prove something that is, is basically just not there. And yet you're being told you have to, to provide a lot of compliances for the paperwork to be able to verify this. And that's a genuine frustration. But I think that is precisely where this conversation needs to be lifted up on two levels. Number one, to work more actively across the industry with standards, with government, to be able to address that question holistically in a, in a unified way of it. So we're all collectively working to demonstrate. And number two, I come back to the narrative to then also gently move the conversation on sustainability towards where it needs to go. To talk about what are the issues we should be focusing on today. It's not deforestation. There are places where the industry is making a lot of effort to improve in other dimensions, and we should have the space to talk about that, rather than constantly be pulled back into talking about deforestation. So we need to create a narrative. We need to create a narrative of what sustainability is in the industry today and what matters. And hopefully, if we get into the conversations around carbon and emissions and others, we can start picking up where some All right, the room is slowly warming up. Um, MR wants to come in briefly, um, and I said the room is warming up in terms of the discourse. I'm pretty sure the room is still a little bit cold, but hopefully that will warm up too. I have somebody 
whisper, it's freezing. Yeah, um, my name is Emma Chandran. Uh, I thought I would represent the planters here because looking around the room, there are hardly anyone. They're all busy in the field sorting out their labor problems. <laughs> um, just a suggestion, you know, having been in the industry and having had dialogues with the government at various state levels, one of the handicaps that we have in Malaysia and in Indonesia is that forest land is under the state government and not the central or federal government. Now, when the oil palm industry is under the spotlight and with all the satellites out there picking out clearing of forests, and it happens on a daily basis in Malaysia and in Indonesia, I can tell you that. There are so many organizations out there who monitor this. But the assumption out there is that that clearing is for oil palm estate or a small or a small holding, which is not necessarily true. So what we need is, uh, I was going through the forest regulations of various countries, and what I found was, India, of all the countries in the world, who has a large forest reserve, came up with an act in 1980, not too long ago, and which is called the Forest Conservation Act. And that extends to the whole of India, in other words, the 28 states and eight territories of India. And it states like this, no state or any other authority shall make any order concerning reserved forest except with the prior approval of the central government. Now, in Malaysia, we have about 18 million hectares of forested area. And, and interestingly, would you believe that 5% of that is owned by private, not by the state government or by the federal government, it's owned privately, 5% of that, that's a large area out of 18 million hectares, 5% is owned by them. Now, we have the National Forest Policy, we have the National Forest Act of 1984, but that does not give the authority to the central government to override a state government ruling. This is the dilemma that we are facing here and in the provinces in Indonesia. So how can we, following this form, put out a message to the government, especially in Malaysia, to say, look, you need to create this reserve forest need to identify this pristine forest and how do we conserve it. So can we have a national uh, regulation to, you know, to enforce that? Because if you don't do this at the central government level, and if you look at the states within Malaysia, for example, some are very rich, they have the income when you look at their budgets, but some are very, very poor, and the only resource they have is the forested land. Hence, we have this dilemma of, you know, forest clearing taking place, and the ultimate culprit of all this is not any other company, but the oil pump companies. So how do we overcome this? That's my question to you. Well, um, I think it's a very big question, and I'm not sure whether we have people who can look immediately after it. Um, I know that there have been attempts in the past government here at the central level to work out arrangements with state governments, so which I was involved in in the past, to basically pay state governments to fiscal budget to conserve forest areas. Um, politically, I do not think there's ever been the, the space for the central government to override the state on the issues that are in the state schedule of the constitution, but I know there were policy prescriptions around essentially steering federal government allocations towards states that were conserving forests as a way of compensating them for the loss of economic opportunities, so to speak. But certainly something I think that 
the point you raised about the difficulty of the fact that the state governments play a key role here. I think that's crucial. And perhaps the solution is both in the combination of what you talked about and also what Olivia talked about, which is encouraging subnational governments, state governments, district governments, to take a stronger leadership role in demonstrating deforestation peace reduction. Because the market actually recognizes the value of that and is willing to, to steer resources and investment in that direction. But I am conscious that we're dramatically over time at this point. So I'm going to move us on to the next panel. A huge thanks to our colleagues. Please join me in thanking them for being here. Thank you. Thanks a lot as well to Mr. Asmi, Mr. Oliver, and Mr. Yen for the insightful discussion. And of course, JD for moderating the session. Okay, so now it's time for our second panel where we'll be discussing topics related to carbon emissions, specifically on how methane um, emissions can be reduced. We have three main panelists for this session, which, which will also be moderated by JD. They are Mr. Mwazam bin Mohammed, Senior Vice President and Head of the Investment Stewardship Division of Pramodala National Burhad. Mr. Rashid Retza, Chief Sustainability Officer of San Darby Plantation Burhad, as well as Kwa Kiet Singh, Senior Lecturer of School, and School of Engineering at Monash University, Malaysia. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, now, we're going to shift our focus a little bit here to look at one of the other issues that is talked about a lot in the context of sustainability. And in fact, if you look at sustainability in the broad global context, outside of Hong Kong, this is probably the biggest issue that's talked about in the world today. And this is the climate emergency and how we deal with emissions and how we move towards net zero. We have a distinguished and interesting panel here today with us. Um, and I'm going to, and forgive my voice occasionally breaking, I'm going to pass it straight on to the first of our three panelists, uh, Chip Mazam because I thought it would be useful as we contextualize how Malaysia is dealing with the challenge of net zero to hear a little bit about how the major influences on our industries um, are seeing this challenge, how they are putting into it. And of course, PNB, uh, being a major shareholder of many key um, industries and companies in, in Malaysia, um, has a very influential voice in that space. So if you could maybe start by giving us a sense of where the level of ambition is at that level, then we can start narrowing down to what much of what is you're giving to Russia and the others. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, firstly, thank you, uh, organizers, for inviting me. So I guess uh, when it comes to sustainability, PMB is really green, no uh, party that. Because we just launched our sustainability framework just under the month ago. But if you look at how important sustainability is for BNB, uh, like you mentioned, so we, our income now is about 342 million uh, yet, uh, assets under management of about 343 billion. Uh, that is about 1820 in terms of domestic and international. But if you zoom in on uh, public activities, it's about 60%. That translates to about 10% of Rusa Malaysia. So for every dollar that's invested uh, on Rusa, 10 cents was money that was invested by the enemy. Another aspect which is quite critical is that in terms of the companies that we own. So if you look at uh, Rashid's land bank, uh, it's about 341,000 hectares. Uh, in Asia, that is more outside Asia. But if you include um, Peace Net Bank, Sandalby Property, which we invest in as well, and then SP Satira. So all these three companies we own more than 50%. Uh, quantitatively, it's about, in terms of acres, it's about 870,000 acres. So that's the size of about five Singapore's. So if you look at uh, how much land we technically have a say in, uh, that's the size, the relative size for you. So we measure that one single hand can determine, you know, uh, what happens to this uh, five Singapore's worth of land. So for us, uh, apart from climate risk, I think uh, biodiversity risk is also important, and also labor, which all of which are topics of discussion for today. 
So uh, with that in mind, we, we took a step to uh, launch our sustainability framework in April last year. So ever since, we've been working hard, uh, sleepless nights, working the bits and bobs of uh, energy routine because ultimately we want to issue a, a, a credible energy plan. So I was told I only have seven minutes to talk about this. So we did the East Space, uh, we have a net zero target, uh, enterprise target to be net zero by 2035. Uh, whereas for portfolio, given our past holdings, uh, we decided to keep the target uh, net zero by 2050. And the third uh, environmental target that we have also is to invest up to 10 billion ringgit in green and transition assets. So within this space, uh, we'll be working with our consultants to uh, really plan and strategize on how we build a credible net zero plan. And uh, we're happy to say that we've done our first part of our baseline emissions, uh, not just for scopes 1 and 2 only, but also parts of scope 3. So we measured scopes uh, 3.1 until 3.7, uh, and then the, the bundle of all 3.3b, which is uh, finance emissions, uh, covering 80% of our asset dimension. So the only 20% that we put we have this line is cash, and then uh, some of the fund of funds that we invest in because it doesn't make sense to, to measure emissions of a fund. So uh, I don't want to uh, announce too much, otherwise uh, Nini will be upset with me. But basically, uh, our CEO will uh, unveil our natural strategy sometime later this year. And uh, we'll be very uh, careful to be sure that our natural plans are very well. For instance, when it comes to emissions, we look at several of the frameworks out there like SPTI, uh, NCIF, NZAO, DPI, and SAMI. So basically, all of these uh, net zero analysis have their own approach on net zero claims. So, uh, but to keep it short, basically we look at uh, ways to like carbonize certain sectors, the ones that are critical for BNP. Uh, we also look at how much coverage we want to have when it comes to uh, engaging some of the key portfolio companies. Uh, there's also something which is very new, which is the temp temperature rise approach, which is still very uh, new, maybe something like that. Uh, so that's how the net zero plan. On the 10 million uh, investments in green assets target by 2030, uh, we just approved our internal taxonomy. So we looked at several areas that we can invest in by order of investment markets. So we, Basically, we looked at uh, clean energy, mobility, uh, green buildings, waste to energy, uh, air, forestry, and other uh, carbon capture, as well as hydrogen. So, we looked at all of these seven asset classes, well, as, uh, components, and later our CEO will uh, announce maybe four sectors that we will focus on when it comes to green investing. So, that's on the key side, generally. On the S side, there are various commitments that we made uh, surrounding living wage, uh, and then balancing profitability with social investments, and then also on labor rights. So we launched our labor rights policy in December last year, and uh, each outlines six key elements that uh, undermine the policy, and then at the same time, our expectations on uh, companies like uh, Sun Plantation and some of the other labor intensive companies as well. So, uh, we reveal like an internal scoring methodology uh, how well this company scores in terms of uh, labor rights. Yeah. So we did G. Um, G basically wraps up everything uh, right, because uh, we have a triple bottom line stewardship model, not just focusing on uh, profits but also people as well. So when it comes to people, uh, my team and I we also look at the board points across our portfolio companies, particularly the nominee directors. Uh, because I think uh, on top of management responsibility, the board is also key in terms of uh, leading organization in terms of sustainability. So I can't tell you how many times companies have reached out to us wanting to find more experts in sustainability because probably that's the number one request from companies today. Uh, and then probably the last one on G that we mentioned is on uh, transparency in voting. So we have our own voting guidelines in place. Uh, which we have uh, practiced over the years and we are also very transparent about it. 
So if you open up our website, you can actually see our voting decisions uh, for the past two, three years. But starting this year, we will expand the decisions ahead of time, before they actually so that the companies will know how we intend to do it. Uh, but going forward, uh, since we're talking about climate change and, and whatnot, uh, there are plans internally for us to embed climate risk, uh, biodiversity, biodiversity, and also the issues into our global guidelines. So you might see in the future uh, policies whereby we will vote against a certain director, or maybe the chair of the sustainability committee, if there are uh, unaddressed issues when it comes to climate, uh, biodiversity, and also human. So that's, uh, I hope you have seven minutes. Yeah, I don't have time as well, but um, thanks so much, Professor. This is fascinating to hear on two levels. One, and I think in terms of context, those of you who work in, in the sector realize that what PNB is doing, um, which is impressive, is also very much aligned with what most of the major global sovereign funds and others are doing. And as we talk in the industry about the challenge of demonstrating net zero compliance uh, for certification purposes, for the demands of the market, for regulatory demands from our uh, buyers and, and, and foreign governments. It's also important to recognize the environment within which you work, the ecosystem within which we operate, is also moving in the same direction. And so the challenge for us to be able to achieve net zero, to be able to demonstrate the building an industry that is compliant with climate ambition, is very much a challenge and a mandate that's being given to us by government, through regulation, by our shareholders, through the actions of as well as by many other activists and others in the street. Now, how are companies in the industry responding to this? I took a minute here to also let Chevashin stop sweating because when PNB tells them this is where we need to go, this is basically what SDB needs to do. So, for that reason, as well as many others in science defense, I know that Simon Garden Plantations has been working actively in this space. And I should maybe give us a flavor of how the industry is responding specifically. So with 
regards to making a net zero commitment itself, we started looking at it probably around two years back. Uh, at a point in time where there were a lot of companies uh, declaring net zero ambitions, declared, uh, setting net zero targets, we decided for some organization to basically try and understand what exactly you know the net zero commitment targets are, and also whether or not we can do it uh, practically, and what are the sort of things that we need to do to actually meet the net zero uh, roadmap before making a commitment. So we spent quite a lot of time internally developing our roadmap first, identifying what we call the pathways of uh, reduction, whether those are practical in the immediate term, medium term, the long term, to at least give management the board some level of comfort that the commitments that we are going to be making, which is you know, 2030 and 2050, are practical and are reasonably achievable. So after spending quite a significant amount of time uh, looking at this, uh, end of last year we decided that you know the company itself was comfortable enough to make a commitment, and we we basically made a commitment to three uh, three key strategies. So number one. It's about what we call acceleration of a renewables business. So this is essentially looking at, you know, the sort of methane capture program across our mills. We, in, in total, we have around 72 mills across our uh, global operations. So to date, we have 14 of our mills uh, with five gas plants ready. And the target is by 2030 to at least have 40 and 2025 to make sure all of our mills uh, have methane capture in. So it's about accelerating something that we are already doing. Second was we also looked at uh, solar as an, uh, as an opportunity as well. So uh, we have uh, 600,000 hectares of land bank uh, across our operation to Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands. So we are looking at areas which are not as highly performing and not as highly yielding, and whether there's an opportunity if we were to implement solar farms we already have one large scale solar farm uh, up and running in, uh, in the northern region, and we're really looking at you know, whether there are other opportunities uh, for these sort of capabilities uh, to basically sell an uh, renewable energy grid to contribute uh, to the decarbonizing of the grid in Malaysia. The second strategy is essentially looking at our energy. So we are looking at how do we transform the way that we approach land use to reduce the amount of emissions. So one, I, thought, I mentioned it just now, it's about deforestation. So we already have our own deforestation equipment. But there are also other sources of emissions for the company land use, things like replanting. How do we reduce the amount of emissions that come from replanting? Fertilizer. Can we explore options for fertilizers which are low carbon emissions? There's a question on deep plantation as well. When we have a no, uh, no new planting uh, on feed policy, but there are still emissions from feed plantations just due to them being there. So what are the sort of options that are available to us? So we sort of identified 400 hectares of feed plantations in Sarawak, where we are currently planning to rehab, and uh, we're trying to see what are the sort of solutions that uh, come out from there, which would help us reduce emissions from feed plantations, which could potentially And then it's not just about emissions, it's about removals of emissions from the atmosphere. So, you know, in total, we have around 47,000 hectares of our land bank identified as conservation set aside. So, those essentially suck up more carbon from the atmosphere. And we're looking at increasing the amount of uh, what we call conservation areas uh, via deforestation. So, what we've done as well is areas which we identify as unplantable reserves. We are now in a process of reforesting all those areas that are on top of the forest And the third key strategy that we're looking at uh, around the, our method of commitment is essentially looking at what we call engagement from the society. Because you know, this is essentially our school creation. And this is an area that you know, we didn't really look, uh, look at previously in uh, great detail, but moving forward, it is uh, going to be more and more integrated. Up. So with regards to emissions, our supply chain emissions, we actually look, break, break it down into two areas. One is what we call feedstock emissions. Feedstock are uh, the 
decarbonizing the grid. I'd like to mention TNP and Rosolasso. Uh, TNP's emission in that year was 29, and Rosolasso was 48. So combined, they are well, almost the same as our net emissions. Yeah. Now, when we look at potential use of biodiesel, biogas, and biomass as primary energy supply, it's as much as 25%. Where are we today? Currently, it's at 1%. So there's a huge gap there, lots of potential there. And that's why it's so interesting to me. Point number two, for us as engineers, measurement is very important. And uh, so I'm very pleased that RSPO has this uh, pump GHG calculator. It's a very good start. I think it goes as far back as 2000. Years back already, yeah. but it's, I think that members have started reporting different things in the airport. Yeah. So in uh, April, April last year, Mosta organized a climate change webinar, yeah. and uh, RSP was there. Actually, was there. Yeah. 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 We couldn't see each other because of one line. <laughs> yeah, and so RSP shared with us that the. Uh, Milk and supply basis emission intensity was mainly 0.8 to 1.9 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of CO2. Yeah. And that's for Malaysia in 2018. So we started measuring, we are somewhere there. Now, at that webinar, we also invited uh, Maria Lucenza Shirako from Italy. And she shared with us that uh, she worked out the LCA without deforestation that it could be. So we seem to be getting there. So my colleague and I, uh, and, uh, a chemical, fellow chemical engineer, Tamaraja, uh, uh, decided to check out the figures, different sources that she used, FAO, and we found out those sources. And we came to the conclusion that the gap and full utilization of uh, biomass to come to a figure of 0 0.01. Okay, it's net zero. Yeah. And, uh, so that was what we came to, and therefore, based on this, soon after COP26, we actually published an article in the saying that we could farm industry to be net zero. Now, at the same uh, climate change webinar, we invited uh, Dr. Vijaya Subramanian, and she came and told us that it's possible to you know, get a scenario with net negative of 8 kilograms per kilogram of our gas, so that avoids the methane reduction. A very important thing for us. And then there's also non energy uh, users where uh, carbon is captured, and uh, for example, in paper pollution and so on. So, I'm hoping that RSP will consider giving credit, uh, expanding the credit uh, to companies practicing this. Number four, um, I'd like to look at examples of excellence, and uh, certainly top of my list now. Give you a lot of good examples, so I'll tell you about the other ones. Uh, the next one on my list is Idaho Edible All in Zabeka with their combined heat uh, power plant that uses 95% electricity. That I think is fantastic achievement. And they, they just got the uh, um, National Energy Award uh, just a couple of weeks ago. This was for 2002. But not to change the government, I think they just got the award recently. And, uh, and then the IOI called Farmwood Factory, MGV's e EFP Park and Paper Factory in Macau, Kelke uh, with the filter press for foaming, where you take out the solids first, yeah. and then United Malacca for composting foaming and EFP. So, a lot of examples, right? but I think not enough, right? and that's why we are here today. We need more and more examples of this. Now, point number five, I'd like to talk about availability and quality. Um, availability and quality, I, I think you might be surprised at this very good. You can't always get the climax you want, you know, the quality you might need. Yeah. And therefore, it's, well, without that, it's almost treated like waste and it should not be. Yeah. So, one of the things that uh, I think should be done, and that has been uh, postulated by some people as well, that biomass should also be regulated by FPOT. 
with specifications, appropriate specifications, of course. Yeah. Um, because when investors come in, they need to be assured. I've got the quality of RMS I need for my process. I've got the quality that I'm designing my plan for. So with that in place, I think RMS of all the different rates and so on, the value will start to fall in place. And it becomes something of value and not waste. Now, we also need data on RMS usage. Because as I'm talking here about the savings that we need from GSG, where's our data? How can we calculate what our national net emissions would be? We need that. I don't know what it is at the moment. Point number six, um, I think Judy mentioned about circular economy. I, I'd like to take that a bit further. I call it industry symbiosis, yeah, where industries work together to what is so called my waste, we use it and make a valuable product and so on. Yeah. And uh, I think here is where there needs to be a mindset change for the year to work with others and not consider just extraction of our more as the main uh, business. Now, I was under Edward Sandakan, I'll quote them again because they use the EFP. Its biomass boiler and power plant uses EFP from the nearby winds as fuel. And the residue boiler ash, being rich in potassium, is sought after as fertilizer in the plantations. This reduces its scope one and scope two THG emissions. This is an example of industry symbiosis between three parties. The estate, the mill, and the refinery. Yeah. So we should see more of that, and of course, there is the Bahadatu POIC. But industry symbiosis is not be limited only to one industry, can be a mixture of industries and so on. Now, um, EMB has always been difficult because of high moisture, but there is a process that uh, Offset the farm, farm all processing special interest in the form in uh, IPE 2015. Uh, somebody came and said, yes, you can make more biomass using co digestion in anaerobic co digestion in um, But the idea to catch on in Malaysia, I hear that there's a plant being built together with a refinery in Indonesia. So this is another example of uh, industry synthesis. Um, SEDA and the MyMER, the recent one, they talk about clusters to generate energy more efficiently. Yeah. If I take that a bit further, we could start having green integrated complexes. I think SEDA talked about 11 clusters. So, at the same time, when I talk about mindset change for the mill, I think there needs to be a mindset change for others too, outside the power industry. They need to also work together with the power industry, perhaps uh, the EMP. So last but not least, point number seven on government policies and financing. Um, there's an energy, national energy policy, 2022-2040, to prepare us to be uh, carbon neutral in 2050. Um, so under the strategy two of strategy trust one, uh, it's aimed to unlock potentials of indigenous biomass, uh, bio-based energy resources, and certainly are all the important part there. As the National Biomass Action Plan is taking place now from uh, 2020, 2025. I hear it will be out by the end of the year, but I hope there will be good, uh, a good, strong case for uh, our monuments. Now, government tax taxes will not have the effect to move people to use biomass. So I think the use of biomass needs to be completely Otherwise, it will not move. And banks can help us. Uh, when they want to demonstrate refinancing, refinancing in the ESG portfolio, uh, they should include investments in power biomass and power plants. Now, I heard that the energy transition roadmap should be coming out in a few months, and I hope that will include power biomass in the well. So, in the less than three years that I've been looking at this, I'm impressed with the potential of power biomass, and I hope to be taken on because its potential move us towards our, uh, our, our, our malicious uh, carbon neutral position in 2050 is very, very large. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. So colleagues, we um, provided a bit of a buffet here. 
in terms of looking at the net zero challenge in Malaysia. Everything from the biggest picture of how major organizations like PNB are setting the stage, providing the direction, how companies like SIGN are leading the charge in that way, but also from Mr. Kwa, a sense of the potential that still exists as we optimize the industry. And very importantly, as he pointed out, looking at symbiosis, not just how we optimize within the palm sector, but how we optimize across the national conversation on energy generation, optimizing uh, how we produce energy in a way that minimizes CO2 emissions. How we optimize, a couple of colleagues talked about, the use and allocation of our land in Malaysia to meet CO2 emission targets, to meet energy independence, as well as continue producing our power. And that really is, I think, the frame in which we should be thinking about what we would like to see as a policy direction. How we start to move towards a policy frame for this that captures the interconnections amongst all these different uh, actors in the way that PNP is doing when they look at having a net zero commitment across the entire portfolio. So I know we're getting desperately close to coffee break time. I can feel the hunger in the room, but perhaps it's also a bit of a hunger for conversation before we start. <coughs> Yes, Henry. So, you're next. Okay. Uh, many of the independent nominee directors of the estate companies are unfamiliar with the full range of sustainability issues. And so, in order to join up the dots and bring home the importance of sustainability, would it make sense for the board sustainability committees to be encouraged to meet, say, once a year with the certifying bodies, initially without management presence, to review the whole sustainability spectrum of the group? This would be comparable to the financial auditors meeting at least annually with the board audit committee without management. I thought, thank you.
by themselves. Now, unfortunately, uh, Malaysia did the Renewable Energy Act in 2011, but the, Renew the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, which started in 2010, was supposed to have been completed by 2014, delayed to 2020, and now it is still not submitted for uh, legis enactment. Now, even though the Act has not been enacted, there are private companies under what's called MISCO, the Malaysian Association, Association of Energy Service Companies, who have promoted energy efficiency to major industries and have reduced their consumption very significantly. But if there was an act with adequate funding, just like for renewable energy, the results would have been much more uh, enormous and much more realistic. Uh, one of the things that I can be quite blunt about is we talk of the room here being very cold, we have opened the windows to make the temperature comfortable, and this is really a waste of energy. It has been said for decades, the cheapest cost, the cheapest kilowatt hour is the one you don't use. Here we use it, we pay for it, and waste it by schools or all this. Uh, even the government, government buildings, which are supposed to be with energy managers, I think about 120 buildings that use more than 3 million kilowatt hours every six months, and there's no indication of whether they achieve their target of 5% energy reduction by 2020. Results, statistics are rather difficult to obtain and sometimes impossible to obtain. Now, in terms of uh, biomass, I think a couple of weeks ago, YP Rafizi mentioned that Malaysia should concentrate on hydrogen and biomass when we have abundant biomass. Abundant biomass waste in Malaysia has been talked about for at least a quarter of a century. But until today, I venture to say that there's no abundant biomass waste. Part of the reason is that the waste is, uh, has a high commodity value and part of it was misinformed under the National Biomass Strategy with the result that independent oil mills which had the waste refused to sell it to prospective developers of waste to energy, renewable energy, oil generations. I happen to be involved with the first successful biomass to power generation in Sabah under the GSH plant in Kuna. Others have not succeeded. Under the Renewable Energy Act and Renewable Energy Projections, biomass was supposed to provide up to 1,400 megawatts of electricity power by 2030, about 500 of megawatts of that by 2020. Today, there's only less than 100 megawatts yet. Partly, and I think mainly because of the perceived value of the biomass waste, where it is dumped into either landfills or burnt inefficiently at oil mills rather than sold for generation of power. Now, the mine Ariga has mentioned about clusters. This, to me, is an oxymoron statement because Plantations which have adequate biomass, wanting to import more biomass from adjacent plantations or oil mills, have not been able to get it because of the cost. Now, if you start clustering, you need to have more transport, greater uh, allocation and at least willingness of the providers to sell it, and it's not going to be that much more efficient. Part of it has also been said to use biomass in co-firing with coal power plants. And this is what my RE says. Coal power plants are going to go out of business in Malaysia. So what's the point of recommending biomass co-firing with coal-fired power plants? It doesn't make sense. Similarly, in my opinion at least, it doesn't make sense to use CPO for biodiesel because it's not only a food versus fuel situation, but also it does not necessarily reduce emissions less significantly. And the same applies to electric vehicles, where 90% of electricity in Paris of Malaysia comes from uh, fossil fuels. So it doesn't do much. Whereas in the NKEA in 2010, 
when hybrid uh, automobiles were promoted, their sales volume increased from a few hundred units a year to about 15,000 units a year. And they reduce emissions far more than uh, EVs that are charged from fossil fuel electricity. I have a lot of other things to say, but in terms of time, I think I will leave it at that and uh, hope that there can be some, uh, in a state of some discussion about these issues. Thank you. I will be indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think given the temperature in the room, the Patuapi is always very welcome. Um, one last comment, we'll try and wrap up because I know we're already for a coffee break. We'll say if you could brief. Thank you. My name is Krishna Mukti. I'm an area of energy and power all my life, years since I got here. Palm oil industry is in a very, very enviable position because it's one of the very, very few industries which has the potential to become a net zero industry. Very easy, very, very easy. I'll try to explain why. You've heard about an enormous potential which I acquired, say, on the biomass in the farmer industry. But that's also a destruction why we are not reaching that zero and why we have not found a way to easily reach the net zero potential of the frontage. For last quarter century, palm biomass has always been synonymous with fruity fruit punch. Anti fruit punch is biomass, biomass is anti fruit punch. But anti fruit punch is actually a very small portion from an energy point of view in a palm biomass. You have all the 6 million hectare or 5.5 million hectare toiling from 5 in the morning to late at the night, growing the crops, talking about deforestation, wheat falling and other things. There's only one produce comes from the mills at FRT. 20% of it is oil, 6% is coal. So what's being used in the 90s, 74% is being looked at as waste. A portion of it is empty fruit bunch. Yes, empty fruit bunch comes up as a big mountain at the end of the mills. That's because it's so porous, so much of moisture, so much of potato. There were all the issues with that. But a better fuel which is being used in the mill are the palm kernel shells and the piece of oil. Now, how is it being used? Today, the palm oil mills are running at efficiency about between 30% and 38%. This is documented by United Nations. If we can improve that efficiency, which you can easily improve efficiency to 80%, you are unlocking that much of energy from the mill. A typical 60 ton palm oil mill will be able to export 5 megawatt of electricity, 6,000 hours a year to the grid. And on top of that, you will have that much of energy in the form of heat to support heat in the other industries. And by this way, you will be able to reduce the carbon footprint of CPO, which is about 0 0.84 to 0 0.88. Completely you will be able to remove by improving energy efficiency and improving the efficient use of biomass, which is palm color sharp Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Colleagues, there was a lot to digest there. I'm not going to try and summarize all of it, but I do want to try and sketch out, particularly in the context of where we go in the policy space, some of the key things that I was hearing. If you permit me, and indulge me for two minutes before we actually have our much deserved coffee. The challenge of net zero is something that cannot be addressed in isolated pockets. I think a couple of colleagues in the panel talked about the difficulty when you look at the industry in itself and you try to decarbonize that without understanding the connections to how you decarbonize our energy grid, 
how you do transportation, how you use material from the industry, not just in the circular economy model within the industry, but are connecting to other parts of, of our sector as well. Energy and transport being the key part. How do we deal with that? It's not just a question of saying to the power industry, you need to do better. It's creating the space at the leadership level through companies like PNP, through government policy, to provide that direction. To effectively create a space where the palm oil industry sees itself not just as a producer of palm oil, as was rightly said, but also as a producer of other key products, biomass, etc., which are solutions for challenges that we see at the portfolio level in companies like PNB, as well as at the policy level of government. The challenge will be how we translate that into specific asks to government, how we identify what the direction is and what kind of policy certainty policy inspiration the industry will require to shift its focus from being seen primarily as a producer of one commodity and thereby a contributor primarily to the national coffers through cess and levy and tax, but to being a solution provider for our energy self-sufficiency, for our CO2 commitments, and thereby be able to, as an industry, recalibrate priorities across these different sectors. We listen to what Sangavi was talking about. CO2 reductions is being part of their proper strategy. We hear PNB talking about wanting this across the portfolio of companies. And I think in the PNB context, having the opportunity to be able to connect what parts of their portfolio are doing with other parts to build this kind of more integrated approach that our China is sufficient to talk about. So that's the direction. I don't know that we have sufficient time now, I'm conscious of well over time, to be able to land this on specific policy priorities, but certainly this is something I think we can reflect in subsequent discussions and also in conversations with government and policymakers. On that note, if you permit me, please join me in thanking our panel for a very diverse set of perspectives. And thank you all of you as well for very It's time for our third and final round of panel discussion. This time we'll touch on topics related to strengthening labor rights. The panelists for this round will be Mr. Adrian Pereira, Executive Director and Co-Founder of North South Initiative, Ms. Gajani Raja, Chief Risk Officer of Sime Dabi Plantation Burhat, as well as Ms. Shamila Sigaran, a Senior Independent Non-Executive Director of Top Glove. Dear panelists and Mr. Joseph, over to you. We shifted over to talking about the climate and emissions and energy. There was, I think, quite a deep conversation that um, could have gone on for quite a long time. Um, now we want to shift to another equally important, equally compelling conversation, which is people conversation. So ultimately, this is not an industry just of trees and production plants. This is an industry of workers, an industry of communities, of people in many parts of the world, often in developing countries, trying to find ways in which they can live decent lives, earn incomes, take care of their families. So, in this third and last set of conversations, we want to talk about the workforce in the industry. Many of you know um, there are concerns about the treatment of labor, concerns about forced labor, concerns about exploitation in many parts of the world around our world, as there are with any other but in today's conversation, we want to focus less on a compliance discussion around how we again demonstrate there is no false paper. In the same way that the first conversation this morning wasn't about demonstrating there is no deforestation, but demonstrating how we actually build a forward case. In this conversation, we want to talk about how we build an industry that can be attractive for the talent to the workforce of the future. But let's through the three conversations of the three private scale today, first tackle a little bit that question about where do we stand with the labor situation in the industry. Um, and to kick us off here, I think you can give us a very good overview from the SDP side of where we stand and where we're going. Over to you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just made it to lunchtime. Uh, 
So I guess that's the elephant in the room, what SBP has been faced with for the last three years now, almost three years. Um, so this whole thing started in um, July 2020, when we became aware of this petition that was filed with the USCBP on our allegations of a forced labor in our operations. Now I must say that it really came as a rude shock to us because sustainability has been the forefront of the sign psyche for a very long time. And uh, we always thought we were responsible employers as well for the human rights aspects. Um, I won't go into the nitty gritty details, but suffice to say that it ended up in a finding uh, issued on SDP. And as part of that journey, we needed to understand what exactly was wrong, what were the allegations about, and you know how we could improve, because we most definitely wanted to improve as well. Um, unfortunately, the petitioners and uh, even the authorities were not acknowledging, you know, you know where we, what our gaps were. So what we did was we undertook a continuous improvement program. Now, I'm sure most of you know the size of our operations. That wasn't easy. There are 154 operating units in uh, Malaysia. Um, we needed to do a deep dive as to into all areas of human rights. So we, of course, use the ILO forced labor indicators as guidance, um, and this was that this led to this improvement program that lasted for about a year to 18 months. So it started out as a project, a compliance project, as uh, JD mentioned earlier. And um, but where we have now come to is that it's become steady state. Yeah. So the project phase of it ended when we identified all the initiatives that we one thought we should be putting in place from a human rights perspective. Um, but that ended sometime in April, March, April last year. So just the project phase entailed 500, over 500,000 man hours, yeah, just to implement all these initiatives. But since then, it's become business as usual. And that's the communication that we have been inculcating within our operations as well, that this is not a one-off project. Human rights is, should be part of our psyche, part of our DNA, upholding high standards is something that SDP is very proud of and we will continue to lead the way uh, for the industry in this area. It was a challenge because it, you know, we are you know, 200 years old, we've done no harm for over 100 years, so it's about changing behaviours, yeah? It, was a challenge because people had to unlearn previous behaviors and relearn new behaviors in how we manage our workforce. And uh, with a workforce of now about 24, 25,000, a large portion of whom are migrant workers who are vulnerable, this was indeed a challenge. But having said that, we are over it. The, the finding has been lifted on us. Um, but what is important now is about sustaining those changes. As I mentioned, it's part of BAU. And there's three things that I want to talk, of, uh, talk about that has helped us to sustain changes and make it part of our DNA. The first one being structural changes. Yeah? So we have now dedicated units looking at human rights and worker welfare. Uh, these sit within our upstream operations, and their job is to ensure that one, all the changes we put through continue to be uh, implemented on a, on a BAU basis. And number two, to also look for new improvements. Because human rights, human beings are evolving, right? So as we evolve, our, our practices should also evolve. Number two is a continued focus on enablers. It is vitally important that our work workers have a voice. Yeah? So we've got multiple grievance channels in place as well as social dialogue platforms where site management and workers come together to discuss issues in a collaborative manner. Uh, because who best to discuss these issues and come up with action plans than really with the workers themselves. So continued focus on enablers is the second key aspect. And the final key aspect is even KPIs. Yeah? So we have got an ESG scorecard in place for the last year or so, it's been focused on human rights aspects as well, because what gets measured gets done. And the key aspect of this scorecard is a worker survey. So we survey every single worker on our workforce to hear from them on what their living and working experiences are like with SDP. 
Because who best to hear it from than the horse's mouth on whether you know, things are going right or not going right. No point implementing a million things, but it's not having an impact on the work of horse themselves. So a lot of this was implemented with the view of the migrant worker because they are in a more vulnerable position. But the actions applied across the board to locals. Given that our workforce at the moment is largely migrant worker related and they are vulnerable, we now also have many initiatives to localize the workforce. Yeah? And localization is not easy because we are in a three, what is deemed as a 3D industry. Yeah? So we have had to make the oil industry more acceptable to our local workforce. How do we do that? A lot of investment on automation, mechanization, robotics. Our vision is, you know, that sometime in hopefully not too distant future, the typical worker is someone holding a iPad or a device and controlling machines that can go and do what is considered as 3D work. That's SDP's vision. We're getting that slowly but surely. We've already automated certain things. Um, and uh, when we automate, we then require higher skilled workers to come into our labor force. And when we recruit higher skilled workers, it is at higher pay levels that make it more attractive for people to join us. So JD, to round off, it started off as a compliance project, but we are now well and truly into the BAU phase in entrenching all these practices within our operations. Jenny, thank you very much for that. And I want to also echo back to what we discussed in the previous panel, um, and he talked about the span of their sustainability commitments and the signal they give to companies in their portfolio. We certainly talked very much also about the social dimension. And I think this is something that echoed the information in spaces. Indeed, it's echoed well outside the palm oil industry. And I think Shaman is going to give us a little bit of an insight on a, a company in a sector that faced a similar challenge, how it was responded to, but also maybe to connect this a little bit back to how the human dimension of this is, is so important when you're also looking at things that like how we respond to the climate dimension of others. So over to you. You know, I, you know uh, SDP have made strident changes in this whole area, and I think we just need to hear more from them about how the rest of us can actually move forward uh, in the same way. Because really one of the things I think a lot of companies struggle with is how to embed uh, human rights norms into the entire business structure. Um, a lot of people talk about being human rights friendly or, or caring about other people, respecting other people. But really, when we look at the practices um, from a personal level, but also from a business level, a corporate level, um, there are a lot of gaps in the way people are treated. And really, I think um, a lot of the problem is to do with the way our social environment uh, and political environment has been structured. Uh, which is very divisive. So um, to, to make that and embed that into um, the corporate norm is actually very, very difficult. But one of the things that we all have to remember is that human rights is labor rights, climate change, environmental rights, all these are inextricably linked. And they are linked to the future of our business because again, planet, um, having no people or, or no people are able to work um, means no business as well and no consumers. So um, I think that's one of the things that we really have to remember and I think there needs to be a lot more work done um, and really I hope someone will ask a question of it, SDP, uh, SDP, how they actually made those structural changes because that's where the real uh, struggle will be. Um, when we do human rights training, um, a lot of people say the right things, they say the right noises, but outside of the training, I hear things like referring to migrant workers, yes, but they're not like us. And it makes me wonder, you know, what, do they have two heads? Are they aliens with two heads? Do they have a long sushi tail like a cow? I mean, you know, what do you mean by they're not like us? Um, if we look at the uh, United Nations um, UDHR, Declaration of Human Rights, um, the preamble, the, the opening sentence, talks about the inherent dignity of the human being. And this links to, which are equal and um, inalienable to the human being. 
which means every single person on the planet has the same rights as each other. And it relates to, and it talks about being relates, relating to justice um, and peace. Freedoms, justice, and peace. So if a person is not free, um, you know, as we talked about, about um, interviewing and surveying all their workers, but if the workers are not free to speak up and participate freely, um, if they fear being um, sanctioned in some way, having bonuses docked, for example, then they're not going to speak freely and you're not going to get the right um, answers to the survey. So um, these are some of the things that we need to look at and think about. Um, in one of the cases that I did, it was um, the leading case on foreign national land rights, the Southern Impassi case. I was fortunate enough to be involved in that. And again, we saw very clearly how the Oranasi, who will form part of our workforce, um, their lives are being affected by land grabs, but also by the climate and environment that they live in. Um, and if we don't take care of this, then we're already impacting a very core part of our workforce. Um, in the work that I do on children's rights, uh, we have seen a prevalence, a rise in asthma among children. And these children are going to have behavioral issues. Um, we're doing research now, tracking the behavioral and emotional impact of having asthma on a child, um, the kind of social impact it has on the child. Um, they often suffer from low self-esteem. They often struggle to have good contact with peers and make friends. Um, and these children are the workforce of the future. These children are going to come into the workforce with illnesses like asthma, and taking time off for that. They're also going to be coming into the workforce with lower self-esteem and mental health issues, um, which as employees we're going to have to take care of. And all this relates back to bad air quality. So when we talk about human rights and, and businesses protecting human rights, we really need to think about the fundamental rights of the human being, about right to clean air, right to uh, good drinking, potable water, um, the right to health, education, um, sanitation, and shelter. Thank you. Thanks, um, I think the reflection both of you shared about the challenge of shifting structures and systems, and the question you already asked about how the SME make those structural changes and come back to it, um, all points to the fact that, again, we can't deal with these issues as isolated, systematic, symptomatic, deal with them as compliance issues where in order to continue being regulatory compliant or get access to markets, we need to show a minimum level of, of effort. But rather to shift very much the entire way in which we view our workforce and view the challenge of ensuring that we have the workforce we will need in the decades to come. So we're creating the conditions, not just in terms of employment, but also in terms of the lives and livelihoods to ensure that a supply of workers for willing and able Um, and that always brings us back to the question then of well, what role is there at the national level? Because I think many people, the other element of the room is, many people are aware that a lot of the issues on which some of these industries, some of these companies criticize around false paper are not issues that are specific to those companies, but are systemic to our industries, and in fact, we argue to the Malaysian economy overall. So how do we at the broader level start to tackle this? Drop that hard one on Adrian um, and let him see what he wants to add to the conversation. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Adrian. I'm from the North South Initiative. Um, I had one very strange experience where one of these companies, uh, which was on this blacklist, um, uh, the, I was talking to the CEO, and as we were doing the labor audits, few hundred workers' names were missing from the list and we were asking where's the list and he gave this answer that was like almost like a school kid saying the dog ate the list I won't say exactly how but he lost the list but uh, that made me then realize that yeah, the, uh, if the CEO doesn't take responsibility or doesn't know what's going on uh, and he may think that okay let me dump it on the sustainability officer uh, sooner or later, he will have to answer for that. And uh, it wasn't just 
one company, there were a few other companies um, that you know we, we realized that uh, they don't have that expertise. So in, in that question is what does the government do? Okay. So the government's job is not to, to get involved in how we run your business, but to set regulations. And uh, even that, most of the, the labor reforms were inspired externally. Uh, if you remember the non-specific partnership agreement, it was a labor consistency chapter. So that pushed for reforms, uh, and about eight to nine different laws were supposed to be amended. And that has happened. But still, uh, when you look at the labor sector, uh, there's so many cartels, there's so many um, so many actors who want to get a piece of that pie. So then I started feel, feeling sorry for the private sector and, and there I am. So uh, yeah, looking at labor audits, um, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. Um, if the government systems don't match uh, the private sector systems, then uh, you know they're going to to continue for a long time. So one example is if you need, uh, during a peak period, you need an uh, extra labor force. Where is that labor force going to come from? And uh, legally, uh, I don't know what solutions you all may to use, but legally it's not. So I can see there are certain gaps in the law that pushes companies to try and be creative, but then to get themselves into trouble. Uh, and it's only a very strong political will from the government side, uh, inspired by the CEOs, pushed, uh, driven by uh, the companies that can, you know, hopefully one day make them realize that, hey, you don't need to wait for some global black place, you know, to, to, to make the change. And it's not just the Americans, huh? the Canadians are going to come up with something. I mean, they have to follow because of regional agreements. The Europeans are going to come up with something, UK. Australia. So uh, let's not wait for that to happen. Um, the question is if government cannot come up with something creative and effective and even enforce it, then what goes to you guys play? So my proposal is uh, like what was shared just now, the workers' voice. Don't take for granted workers' voice. Uh, I remember asking the Scandinavian em embassies, you know, ambassadors, how did they drive uh, or achieve excellence? Historically, uh, you know, in industry 4.0. So, uh, almost all of them said that uh, it is an element of the union's involvement. And I know it's sticky, you know, I've seen some, some really uh, 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 bad unions and unionism. But uh, those unions, uh, the good ones, you know, whether they, they understand the ethics, whether they're genuinely fighting for workers' rights, can play an important role, not just for the bargaining. I think this sector has a MAFA collective agreement, but raise the bar, raise the bar, raise the standards. Uh, so what the Scandinavians did was they let one worker sit on the board. So it's not just okay putting 30% women, but slowly letting workers have a, a better say or a bigger say in how to run things. And you know, yeah, I mean, they may be blue collar workers, they may not have the highest uh, literacy rate, but uh, we have seen how in other places uh, that fills in certain gaps. And of course now workers are also worried what happens yeah, with just transition out of uh, carbon emitting jobs. What happens to them? Are we just going to chuck them aside? Where's the solidarity support for, for them? Uh, what are the new industries that are going to be created? So the labor movement is worried. Uh, I think that if you include them, uh, do a bit of experiment, you know, um, and not just the unions, but the migrant workers in the unions, yeah? don't forget that. Uh, then maybe we can see some, some creative solutions now, yeah? So, uh, yeah, that's a bit for me that you and will answer more. Thanks. Thank you, all three of you. Um, as we look at sustainability and we look at the, um, the human dimension, the worker dimension of this, a couple of things that we that I pick up on not just in this conversation but from earlier ones. Um, firstly, the fact that expectations are evolving. We are often conscious today of where the way in which we structure our workforce, the way in which we treat our workforce, is seen to not meet market expectations. So then the compliance issue comes back. But as I think Jenny was saying from the SDP side, the challenge I think or the, the need 
is for us to look further ahead and think not just about the minimum compliance, but about how we build an environment that genuinely ensures we have access to and can attract and retain the kind of workers we need to build the industry of the future. We talked in the panel about the changes that are coming, automation. And Adrian, you mentioned just transition. I think it's not just the CO2 side, the carbon side of things. It's also as we start to automate, how do we ensure that that transition is something that is, is um, fair to our workers? How do we give them the upscaling and, and how do we adjust as perhaps the labor intensity of our production goes down necessarily over time, which it must. Um, this is an industry that's still about 75% dependent on manual labor, which is a bit of an outlier in most modern economies. We can't expect to continue to be an outlier in a modern Malaysian or Indian economy where we're still heavily dependent on manual labor, when workers have many other opportunities to take on jobs that are perhaps more interesting, more fulfilling, more rewarding, and less taxing. So the challenge on the human side of how we build this, this industry for a future workforce is first of all, the risk management challenge. How do we ensure the sustainability and survivability of the industry? But it's also an opportunity, because as we have to address kind of challenge we talked about on net zero, on decarbonization, on building a modern industry. Actually engaging in workforce, giving them a greater voice, also gives you an opportunity to learn from the levels you've experienced. You want to figure out solutions to how to make your production more energy intensive that you do not have from the network side. So I guess the question I'm asking is, first and foremost, how do we create that kind of an environment in the industry? Learning from the companies that already working their way in that direction? And how do we engage with government, with the policy makers, with those we are accountable to, the financial industry, our stockholders and others, to reset expectations around that? Because, and I will drop this as a, as a point for Brazil as we open the conversation, that also means expecting that we don't look at our workforce simply as a least cost optimization question. Cheapest labor you can get to be able to maximize productivity you need to start looking at your workforce as partners in this exercise, which has implications on our bottom line if we only look at the financial world. So, for this final run through, I know it's been a long morning for many of us, but I'm certainly enjoying myself. Opening for thoughts, reflections, any reactions to people? It's not just the palm oil industry that employs uh, foreign labor, but there are many other sectors, uh, construction, um, manufacturing, that also employs an equal number of large foreign workers. Now, has it, how huge has the impact been of WRO on us? It's been huge. I'll give you one example. We used to export about 1 to 1.5 million tons of palm oil to the US. What has it come down to today? 200,000 tons, just palm oil. And who has this benefited? Our competitor. Today, Indonesia has taken over the market in the US compared to what Malaysia had before. So that itself tells you how important the WRO has been on the palm oil sector here in Malaysia. But I want to go back to something more important. It all goes back to the TIP report. No one seems to talk about the impact of the trafficking in persons report that was released by the US State Department. You know, um, I think it was about five, six years ago when the U.S. ambassador at that time came down to see the ministry and she cautioned that chances are Malaysia was going to be downgraded from tier two to tier three if proper actions were not taken. It was such a serious matter, she actually alerted the government about it. And yes, unfortunately, Malaysia was indeed downgraded to tier three and we have remained at tier three for the last two years. My question is, why hasn't the government of Malaysia rebutted the TIP report? From the palm oil industry, the Malaysian Palm Oil Council has taken the appropriate action. We have provided the corrections to the TIP report on the allegations and claims that have been put on the palm oil sector because unfortunately, a lot of the data sets that were used in the TIP report were old data. 
even the source, some of it couldn't be verified. So these were questions that we had put up to the US State Department. The reply we got was, it's good what the industry is doing. We are happy to see the progress, but we want to see what the government is doing about it. So government action is absolutely necessary. Now, what is the palm oil industry doing to also ensure that uh, you know we are engaging with the US authorities in the past? We have opened up a conversation with the CDP. Uh, the, um, we have brought them down to Malaysia. We have taken them to see a plantation. Um, it's quite amazing. Some people think that, oh yeah, it's a trip to Malaysia, they see and go. It's not just a trip to Malaysia. Recently in February, we brought 12 US authorities down to Kuala Lumpur. It was the CDP, the US Department of Labor, the US Department of State. And you know what was the first impression they got? Amazing, is this really an oil palm plantation? None of them had ever stepped into an oil palm plantation, nor do they really understand how complicated this supply chain is. And I know the highest authority that was there, um, she, Anne-Marie Smith, she said, you know, Belle, I would like to stay here. I sort of got the impression that plantations are different, you know, but this is, has given me a completely different perspective. And I, am, I think that the entire delegation went back to the US with a better impression of how Malaysia runs its plantations. So that was one of the things we did. Now, secondly, we have started to work with Suhakam. We realized that one of the groups that is unable to properly uh, correct uh, the uh, wrong, uh, some of the problems that you may face with forced labor, it is the small holders. The small holders may not have the capacity nor the funding to probably do training programs. So MPOC has stepped in and we are now collaborating with Suhakam to make sure that they understand what it means by false labor. The first, first question we get from small holders is, what exactly is false labor? We just don't understand what is false labor. So when we tell them the first thing you need to do is people that you employ to work in your small farms, you must make sure they understand what are they doing here. I, rem I recall a conversation that we were having with uh, some of the small holders and they said, you know, some of these workers didn't even know what were they coming to in to Malaysia? Where were they exactly working? When they talked about uh, palm oil, they thought they were coming here to pump oil at a petrol station. That was the impression they got. Language, language problems, cultural problems. So there are many things to look at. Now, we are also going to be impacted by the forced labor regulation as correctly been, uh, uh, said by the panelists from the EU. While a lot of us are talking about the EU deforestation regulation, I don't want you to forget that there is another huge regulation that's coming up that is the forced grain labor regulation. And it could be as huge as what has happened to us uh, in the US. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mel. Um, you are close to being the, the main government ref we have in the room today. So <laughs> it's actually really interesting to hear you say that. Because I guess the question I'm pondering is, as we discussed in previous panels, how do we get out of this mode of just constantly reacting when new regulations are imposed? And how do we build a strategy and a narrative on what we're doing with labor, how we're building a, a workforce and an opportunity for a workforce that is far enough ahead that these shouldn't be a problem? You know, second, the deforestation question. We know deforestation is a problem. Our challenge is demonstrating it. On the labor space problem, we still have a problem. And maybe that's where certification bodies at RSPO, you know, organizations like MPOC, need to focus more attention now on how do we build that picture. And coming back to the point that was made, I think, by Asmi earlier also, how do we communicate that picture? Um, we've had this conversation before and, and with Anne Marie. It was instructive for people who are making judgments on the industry to actually see the reality of what goes on and be surprised by it. But to be fair, the point, the, re the problem when they're, they're surprised by it is hardly our problem. That means we're not telling the story well enough. We're not actually showing people the reality of what it is like to work in, in, in a farm oil state. And you're perfectly right, there are dramatic differences between the best and the worst. But we need to also use the best as an opportunity to be able to push the entire industry. 
So, a lot to do here. Um, once again, the challenge we touched a little bit about how the government engages in this is critical because if the overall perception of Malaysia as a country is negative in terms of labor, there is actually a limit to what companies and industries can do to counter that. So, question comes back again. Beyond saying government should take action, what should we get done? Engage, advocate, support the industry in telling the story, support the industry in being able to attract and retain the right kind of workers domestically and internationally. What else? What can we take away from this is ideas that can actually be, be put into action. too many of them, but the process that we went through with respect to RSPO 2018, PMC, but more importantly, the Malaysian National Interpretation, which was 2021. Now, those are very robust and strong standards, and it is approved with the ICO endorsement which is important, and also endorsed, and the decisions arrived are by consensus and not by majority vote, by all the stakeholders. Now, if you look at principle six, which really defines the labor issues, including recruitment, etc., which again, top club was involved as far as the recruitment fees were, and the other important thing is both MSBO and RSBO and others, we, during the process of revising the standards, we had inputs from ILO. ILO representatives actually sat on those committees and provided inputs. So the bottom line is all these standards are supposed to be robust and strong, and there is nothing that, but what we find because of the W, uh, 
withdrawal, the CPP action is that there are obviously gaps. Perceived gaps or political gaps, whatever you may like to call it. But there are gaps between what we are adhering to and what is perceived by them. Now, can you just identify, I've been gone through this in Sandabi, are there really gaps in the principles and criteria between what CBP's expectations are, or their own set of standards, and with the sustainability certification standards? Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's not a matter of gap, it's a matter of interpretation. So, if you look at everything, it's all aligned, right? But even within the advisors that we got to assist us on this journey, they themselves had issues in interpreting the various standards that are in place. So, I mean, we just use ILO cost labor indicators as a guide, but even within that, different advisors had different interpretations as well. So we went with the strictest interpretation because we were faced with the cost labor finding and we had to get out of it. We didn't have a choice. But I think it comes down to consultation and really coming up with a um, more robust interpretation of the standards that are currently in place to ensure alignment with foreign governments as well. Thanks. I think that is a crucial factor and a crucial distinction if I want to simplify it with this conversation around labor and people. We're talking about deforestation, ultimately it's an argument of whether a forest is there or it's not. If you're talking about emissions, you can kind of distill everything down to whether CO2 equivalents are being emitted or not. When you're talking about labor and treatment of people, it's highly subjective. And it's, it's highly subjective in the interpretation of the rules, it's highly subjective in the experience people have of whether they feel they're being treated well or not. So the kind of solutions you need in this space structures need within companies are going to be different from the structures we have needed, the policies we needed, even the certification systems we needed to deal with things like deforestation or climate. How we build that is critical. And equally, that's going to be a challenge to the government policy side. How does government create the leadership for it? And still curious to hear other thoughts, other reflections on what we can actually suggest as a way forward. Before I start thinking of that. Uh, yes. I didn't actually get to the planning just now, but I do remember being told that we'd like to be prescriptive about what we bring to the new government. Um, and really, I think what, we, what we're talking about today is in the context of the new government. I think as Bellman mentioned, there's a host of other regulations coming in, force labor regulations. There's also, I think it's the ESFR, the European Sustainable Finance Regulation, where we've got governments, financial institutions, and their contributions are indirect or direct to deforestation, labor rights issues. So a whole host of things are coming up. But the interesting thing is that when you look at the UDR, it actually puts in place the traceability solutions to everything. And what it does, in you know, course, they're starting with deforestation. But if you read, read the text of it, what they're signaling, human rights are, you actually need to be able to prove that the power that you produce or the other six other commodities are respect labor rights, respect human rights. They are signaling also that eventually they're going to start looking at carbon emissions. And these traceability pathways that we're building right now in order to meet the new in its current form are the same traceability pathways that you need to actually start transmitting scope one and scope two uh, emissions from the power sector down throughout the entire supply chain and therefore completing the scope three for everyone involved in that. And I think the message I think we bring to the government is this is something that needs to be coordinated and it also needs to be funded and invested in because this is also the way that Malaysia is going to meet its 2050 target to be a carbon neutral economy. Yes, the regulation is disruptive, it's a paradigm shift, it's, you know, the Germans call it zeitgeist, it changes the spirit of the age. But what it's signaling is not just regulation for the EU, but countries' ability to also meet the 1.5. Uh, the degree Celsius in the climate, the climate period. Oh. It's on our national pledges, COP26, COP15 biodiversity. Um, and yes, it's onerous in terms of its requirements and its timeline, but the longer term intent, I think, is something that should be supported. 
and it should be more crucially funded and invested. Okay. Oh, hold on. Since you are at the mic, and since you work for me, I can do this to you. So I'm going to ask you a question. Because we talked earlier in the deforestation and climate space about the challenge of traceability, of being able to communicate, to generate the data, and then communicate the information in a way that people at the end of the pipe have trust and confidence in the action that's happening on the ground. Now, when you get into the human dimension of this, the labor and the rights issues, it does become a lot harder because the kind of data you're trying to transmit is much more qualitative. So maybe a reflection from you and I, will not all just put me on the spot. When you're dealing with things like this, how would you build a system that allows a consumer sitting in Europe to make the home choice that the product she's buying isn't being used by someone who's subject to forced labor or otherwise feels the need to be victim? And here I think we'll talk about um, so, interestingly, the new year is saying verified data. This is verified So, there are, there are organizations out there, civil society uh, organizations, that do monitor data. So some of the solutions that we're looking at look at the risk based approach. If, is this region in this country known for false labor? Are there instances of child labor being detected? And for a certification body like RSBO, even MSBO, this could come as a risk issue. It's like, oh, okay. You appear to be operating in an area where uh, human rights trafficking has been detected in the past. This is something you should pay attention to, to the auditor, to the to the CPP in that sense. And as that information is transmitted, then you know it's it's a question of risk management. This area where this unit was uh, operating has is known to child labor. It has been addressed during the audits, during the certification, um, and assessed to be okay. Now that doesn't mean that there won't be any gaps. And it doesn't mean that everything's peachy. But if you can catch 90, 95, and 98% of those cases and usher them in the right direction, then the violations are just statistical uh, anomalies rather than normal. And I think that's what they're trying to get towards. Yes, violations will happen. We're all humans. We all butt on our own selfish interests sometimes. But collectively, I think, you know, you want to push push the industry towards good. And then statistical anomalies become something that we can deal with on an individual basis, that rather than creating this entire basket that you have to deal with collectively uh, without really a lot of direction on how to do it. Thank you. I'll let you have a quick I have um, to reply well, to this. Um, Very yeah. quickly. No, I was going to actually point out to what you said just now, which was that the, the challenge that was in the risk-based approach is precisely if we don't deal with systemic issues like TIP report finding, the perception will be that no matter what companies in this region or this country do, will still be seen as high risk because at the policy level we're not providing assurance that the national system is being care of it. But I think you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, thank you very much for that. But I have a question for the panel. What if lesser regulations, more collaboration, more acknowledgement of the efforts that have been undertaken by the industry? Why can't the Europeans do that? How long are you going to keep increasing the bar for us. You know, we've done what you've asked. You wanted sustainability, you wanted sustainable palm oil. Malaysia has produced it. What more do you want under the EUTR now? There's a due diligence requirement. Isn't MSPO, RSPO, or ISPO, or any certification that you've had in the past sufficient? That's my question to the panel. Oh, can I get an answer to that? Because that's the same question that I pose to my European friends very often, and I've got no answers to that. In uh, defense of the panel, and for once again, there's a lady waiting to speak as well. In defense of the panel, of course, I don't think anybody here is speaking on behalf of the EU. But we'll come back to that and maybe ask it in the context of how do we make a better case. But I have a lady waiting over here, and I know she would be able to come in as well. I'll try to keep it as quick as possible. Uh, afternoon, Shahida from Maybank. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that I'm sitting right next to my shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I, I, I've been listening to all of the conversations of this morning, and I guess I'm tying in with several of the things being said thus far. Um, we fund a lot of companies in this region, and unfortunately, several of them have been hit with the WRO. Now, to that point, to your question earlier, shouldn't there be something to anticipate that this is coming up? Well, not estates, so it's not something new to me. 
Um, but I wouldn't know much about the nitty gritty because we're not, we're bankers. We're very great with iPads and stuff. Not so much with the FFPs. Um, so that, that reactive um, approach rather than a proactive approach of understanding and anticipating, um, it is something that is sorely needed across the country. And, and this is where the, the boundaries of um, corporates need to come down. So that as a community, we collaborate with each other better. It's alarming to me to hear that there were indications to the government and yet nothing was done. Or it would be interesting to hear what was the pushback from industry or small holders that it didn't amount to much, that we were now at tier three and remain there. The other part, that, and because as a funder, it, it doesn't rest easy on us when we have to relook at the funding that we extend or do not extend um, to our clients because there's an RWRO in place. It's problematic for us too. Um, and, and so we do consider the impact to your employees too. It gets mentioned in our audit committee because your sustainability is also ours. And to that score, I think Ajani had mentioned that you're looking at us, giving your staff, that they should be, there should be more iPads on the estates. And when that happens, you have a highly intensive workforce are going to start working down. I'd also like to know what happens to them. So the social sustainability of your employees in terms of compensation, because some of them are going to be left behind. And what are we doing to upskill them so that we can use the iPads? I think that's something that needs to be discussed more and more for those engaging the government or the shareholder. Um, and the whole conversation about social sustainability also needs to come into play. There's a lot of conversation about emission. There's a lot of EEE, and I think we need to go back to ESG. In this region, it's an imperative and not just a consideration. Thank you. Guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let them throw all the questions at you, and then I'm going to throw you back at them and let you kind of <laughs> do a final round of questions. I'm conscious of well over time, but I think we're picking up a lot of key issues here. So just want to give this very briefly, because I do want to give the panel a time to reflect on the many questions we're asking. Somebody has decided who's speaking on behalf of the EU here. This is an answer to a question raised very recently. Two things. One is climate change and emissions. Second one is food safety, both related to farm oil industry and why the animosity between European Union and the farm oil industry. For emissions, I've been to a, a very large public listed farm oil company and I spoke to the owner and the CEO. He tells me, Mr. Krishna, you have come a long way to this evening. Climate change and emissions are European concept. Let's not talk about it here. Okay. A few years later, quite recently, I went to a, a GM, one of the largest armor companies in the world. Before I opened my presentation, the chairman says, please don't talk about climate change or sustainability. If there's anything else, please talk to me. So, in public sphere, very rosy picture. Europeans are very bad guys. But what's happening in the background? I know it's extremely difficult. All these things are very, very difficult things to do. But that doesn't mean that you talk like this. Uh, for, from the Rio de Janeiro people of the world and the scientists have been telling about climate change and how serious it is. Yeah. The Europeans and the Americans are terrified about this. But in this country, no, nobody is bothered. Don't talk about it. The Europeans have told you how, what is the different edible oil, what's the carbon emission. And they've said your palm oil production today is higher than the petroleum diesel. What's the response? Fight against them. This has been the problem. Number two, food safety. Three MCPD was raised 15 years ago. Denial, denial, denial. I went to a government department in charge of this. 
Oh, Mr. Krishna, the AD letters are wet, not on human being. I said, they are looking for a human being. Can you be a person? <laughs> These are kind of conversation. It went right up to the ministry. I raised it personally, and I raised it to the, to the scientific community. Even today, we know why MCP is coming about. You take the sludge oil and put it into the production oil. Simple as that. There's a simple solution. No, you cannot talk to the industry. There is no communication at all between the industry and the scientific world or the private any, any outsiders and the industry. Everything is closed. So what do you want me to do? What can the industry do? This is an issue which we are facing. <coughs> As Professor Jamila said yesterday, somebody said she made a lot of effort. No, she said only two things. She was a psychic advisor to the government. Number one, decisions of course we made on science. Nothing but science. If you don't know science, please understand science. Number two problem with the country, there's no communication. Again and again, these two, two things are reverberating again yeah. and again. So these are only two things. That is important. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a pause and uh, allow the panel to take about what you'd like to sort of convey as a final thought. I'm not presuming you're going to be able to answer all these questions. I do take Mr. Krishna from your um, very valid points of beyond the specifics that you raised. The reflection of what one of the earlier panels talked about, which is we cannot see the concern about climate change or health as only the things that are imposed on us and elsewhere. At the end of the life, in Malaysia, we see this challenge and want the industry to do more of this. And I think that's a voice that's very, very important. But colleagues, um, maybe, Adrian, I'll start with you since you're closest in the line of fire. Just a quick reflection, and, and there will be a lot we are unable to answer, but let's try and wrap up in the next few minutes. Uh, yeah, so you all know this organization, right? I just happened to carry the book, so I'm not promoting them. But uh, when some of the cases that came to us, we actually went to all the members in this agency. And all of them had different interpretations of what false labor is. All of them. So one would say, no, this uh, guy came in without passport, he's false. The other one is saying, no, uh, the, the, the labor agent is managing them, it's not the company's fault. So I realized that government is problematic. Uh, from our side, what we have been proposing is a comprehensive policy to manage all aspects of labor migration. Because the way the laws and the regulations, uh, even the, the policies, it's all very segregated. Uh, one example is we have a national action plan on forced labor, a national action plan on trafficking, and a national action plan on decent work. You just imagine already with the incompetency in Putrajaya, they come up with three action plans run and managed by different ministries. And I don't think they have communicated well among themselves to streamline the ideas. What more uh, to the companies and to the social activists and even the workers, how we solve this. So I think Putrajaya uh, is problematic. We have to push them to either be more competent or tell them to pull the financial plan. Uh, my second comment is there's a lot of fraud in audits. Uh, if you read, read the Transparent uh, Report, you'll see it is a real issue. Uh, in one of the cases that came to us, there were like three or four audits. Everything good, tick, 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 tick. When the final audit, auditor went, uh, that's when the bomb was dropped. This is a very problematic company. So don't wait for that to happen. Uh, unfortunately, this has become a sub-business itself. So again, you know, everybody wants a piece of the pie, and that's tragic. Yeah. So I hope the industries can help us with this comprehensive policy. Force them to do it. So after this, there's no more excuse. Oh, recruitment happens there. It's not in our law. Even that, they didn't, they didn't fix that, the private recruitment act. Yeah. So that's my comment. Um, building on what Adrian just said, once we've got interpretations of it at the policy level, then the ask is that our certification standards are considered, uh, are accepted by all these foreign uh, regulatory agencies as well. So that's bringing it back to you, JD. How do we ensure that, you know, us being uh, certified members of RSPO, that the assurance we get from the Senate is, you know, the gold stamp of approval for us? And that's it. 
Um, yeah, thank you all for what everyone else has said. Um, to add to, to Adrian's three national action plans, we're looking at a national action plan on business and human rights now as well. So um, that's going to be four on all the same issues. Uh, but it's important for the industry. I know some of you have been um, approached and interviewed on that, but it's important for the industry to also uh, input into the national, that action, national action plan because it's already um, in, in the pipeline. It's been drafted and hopefully will come up. But, you know, um, I just want to take up what, uh, to think what I said, I started out saying, and the last um, question about the EU, and I started out by saying that we all need to understand human rights and have a human rights-based approach to dealing with issues. Um, the question, what more does the EU expect of us if we comply with certification, suggests a prescriptive approach and not a human rights approach. So that is where I would encourage greater work and understanding to change our approach so that it is a human rights approach because um, the way business happens is going to change. In the 70s, we did not have migrant workers. Today, we do. So how we deal with workers has to change. Um, the fact that people are being recruited um, from different kinds of communities um, and the way they're brought into the country as migrant workers all that we have to take into account in our handling and dealing with them. The cultural norms, the cultural uh, differences has to be considered also. When we look at the TIP report, it's not just about migrant workers. It's the fact that Malaysia is a source country of trafficking, meaning people are kidnapped, abducted, and sent out of the country, being trafficked into Malaysia as an endpoint, And it's a transit country, meaning Malaysia people are tra trafficked into Malaysia and then out again. So there are a lot of problems and we are aware, because of the work that we've done, we are aware that the government has knowledge of this. We are aware that immigration has knowledge of this. But very little has been done. Again, the primary cause is corruption. So if we're able to sort out and stem corruption, a lot of the issues that we're talking about um, will um, kind of resolve themselves. Um, I just want to make um, to very quick points, if I may. Um, I think a lot more work needs to be done in terms of collaboration uh, with stakeholders. It's not just the communication, but it has to be meaningful engagement. Um, and that's where the government can really play a part, uh, through Sukhakam, through Bayou, which is the, the um, law minister, um, through the various select committees in parliament. But you know, one of the things to consider is whether we actually need a sustainability minister um, under the PM's office, looking at sustainability and a lot of issues which will include SDGs, uh, ESGs and so forth. Uh, we do have the Parliamentary Committee on, on SDGs, um, but are they doing enough? Maybe a little bit more engagement from them uh, could be something that could be considered because um, they actually input into the parliamentary uh, system. So, um, but a lot more work needs to be done in terms of understanding and embedding um, human rights within the national framework. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, there was a lot to cover, including some quite challenging uh, problems posed to us from the audience. But I appreciate the way in which you addressed that. Thank you to all of you for the engagement. A quick return back to the question around what do we do? The government point of view, the policy point of view, but overall as a country, and here's my final reflection. If you look at the three topics we cover today, deforestation, which is the loss of our natural resources, climate emissions, energy, which is basically how do we build the country and the system within the emissions pathways we have available for our, our survival. And the question of how we treat our workers and our workforce, which is ultimately how we treat each other. If you were to ask me, I think the one big shift I'd like to see is for all of us to recognize that these are challenges we need to Ourselves. Not because of regulatory compliance or because of criticism from elsewhere. When we have a better approach to managing our natural resources, it's our resources we manage. When we have a better approach to how we deal with workers, it's our people we deal with, first and foremost. So if we, as an industry and in collaboration with government, can recognize that the final solution to criticism from elsewhere is to create systems and policies that are so effective so good that we're actually well beyond the 
point of criticism. Then we get some. Because remember, when you get to these regulatory non-compliances, you're not even meeting the minimum bar. That's when you get a ban on that product. You're not even meeting the minimum of what's considered acceptable. Should somebody else's minimum be our bar? Or should we be setting a national bar that actually meets our own aspirations? And that's how we can frame our national conversation, I think, is trying to make progress there. On that note, a huge thanks to our panel again. A huge thanks to all of you. And let me hand this back to our um, organizers. With apologies, I know we're almost half an hour late, and I do take the blame for that. So thank you very much, colleagues. A very informative session ended. Thank you all so much for partaking in the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to all the panelists once again.